Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, out of our 943 um, community houses, out of the uh, 15 years, 10 years of that, they've made losses. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so are you able to tell me what the um, total loss is over that 10 year period? Um, I believe it will be in the January report. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at the, the numbers and get back to your councillor. Okay. Okay. Would it be possible in this? Okay. Thank you. And so, um, do you expect us to continue making losses for the next ten years, doing what, given we're doing our ten-year plan? The proposal is whether or not we want to review our policy around how we fund these things, uh, in re in recognition of what has been happening in recent times. Are you suppressing my question? <laughs> Well, are you saying I can't ask this question? No, I'm answering it for you. How have you answered that question? Oh. Councillor, the, the, the specific question we're being asked to make at this meeting is how we fund the operating costs of our public housing, community housing right. portfolio. Yes. My question was, uh, which I thought was personally, of course I'm biased because I asked the question, but I think it's a fair and reasonable question to ask, is do you expect us to make losses similar to what we've made previously over the next 10 years or more or so less? May, maybe I'll refer the councillor to paragraph 18 on page 42, which, <laughs> which tells you that in the 21-22 year we're forecasting a 9% or $659,000 um, subsidi subsidised from the rates. Right. Um, it would be hard for us to make any prediction beyond that given the, the, the decision council has to make today. That's the sort of yearly losses we've been making, isn't it? Is that correct? That's the prediction for the 21-22 years. Yes. Use your microphone when you're asking questions, please. Oh, sorry, I'll bring it a bit closer. M my understanding was we lose about that amount each year. Is that correct? I, I think Ms Bainbridge so far will will look into that for you because you've asked for the figures for the last 10 years and we'll, we can't answer that um, today. So right. we'll, we'll okay. look that up and circulate but, it for you. All right. So, so we're not, with our budgets, we're not able to tell whether we will lose money over the next 10 years or not? It is hard for us to say given the decision that council will make today, but based, based on what we're um, predicting for eight, uh, under paragraph 18, mm -hmm. uh, one would assume that if council chose today not to subsidise uh, rents from, uh, from rates, then you could pr predict a continued subsidisation of a certain level. Yeah. Or, or a so significant increase in the rents that we charge, which, yes, be, which, yes. which council could decide also. Have we had a reply at all from the Minister's office around our letter that we sent asking in the hope that we could charge market rents that would be subsidised? I wouldn't suggest that we'll, that question will be resolved before our budget is adopted. No, I realise that, but I wondered if we'd had any response. Nothing. No, that's a shame. Um, thank you. That's not strictly true. I mean, the, the minister has the minister's office has responded to the letter, and they've made it quite clear that their focus is on expansion of supply, and where um, arguments can be put forward that funding mechanisms being made available will contribute to a greater number uh, of of units um, in the supply chain, as opposed to funding uh, existing housing stock, which is my understanding of what council's request was. But there has there has been a response, albeit um, not one satisfactory to the policy positions of this body. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Richard. I just want to confirm the number of units we've heard from two councillors, differing numbers. And on page 55 it says that we have 936 <coughs> units. Is that correct? Currently, yes. Uh, in the report it also says that um, if that it were, we could immediately build four units a year. I just want to check what the price of a unit is. I've made a calculation in my head and I just want to see if that's correct. Approximately a build cost of about 250k per unit. So if we were to invest $10 million over 10 years, that would be 40 units? Difficult to say what the cost would be in 10 years' time. Well, but, uh, but today. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and if we were to invest $20 million today, then we would be able to build 80 units. Approximately. And that would take us up to approximately a thousand units? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Just a question in respect to the submission we had from our constituent about Abbeyfield uh, as part of the hearings. Um, David, do you see any role for Abbeyfield in whatever solution Council might come to about future provision? Or have you thought about that? Has that been factored in? Maybe I could answer, yeah. uh, Councillor, that uh, you will have read in a number of submissions that um, people are asking us as a council to be flexible in the way that we respond to housing issues and we're encouraging council to work with other organisations, EWI, uh, NGOs, uh, as widely as possible to get the best solution. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. Um, is it not that um, should the council be able to um, be eligible for income-related rents like Kainga Aura and community housing providers, we would more than break even on our housing um, stock and be able to reinvest in more housing? Um, just, just to clarify a point there, Kangora are not um, eligible for the income related rent subsidy as a, as a Crown agency. Um, and in answer to your question, not necessarily? Not necessarily, and no. why would that be? Again, it would depend on the decisions that Council make in terms of setting the rents. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as to the matter that we're considering around the prioritisation of, of community housing for people over um, 65, um, depending on the date that that's brought in, what would be the approximate numbers that would be kind of left um, going down the priority list because they're between 55 and 65? So currently in our priority one group we have approximately 170 people and about 50 of them will be between 55 and 65. The majority will be over 65. And was there any thought given in terms of the way this might pan out um, to um, give the people on the wait list at the moment an opportunity to stay there and just have it apply to new applicants? What would be the downside of that or the unintended consequences of that? I think we ha how we operationalise the decisions that Council makes today will be reflected in a, a, a revised policy that will be brought back to Council at a future date. Thank you. I have a question around the, I mean this is a budget, a budget meeting as I'm sure we'll be reminded, um, and so the, the big decision for us to make at this meeting is around how we want to fund the housing that we have and how many units we want to build over the next 10 years. Uh, I just have a question as to how critical it is for staff for us to uh, land a decision on our prioritisation policy, particularly in relation to not just questions, because we asked a specific question about age, but submitters have raised issues around and people with impairments and disabilities, and given that we have committed to building universally accessible housing, then you could make an arg argument for... You know, I'm not making it, but I just want us to have the opportunity to be able to, and, and choosing between two age cutoffs at this meeting isn't going to necessarily let us do that. So what would the, the downside be of, of, of not making a decision on this at this meeting? Um, I, th I think reading the submissions, uh, as you imply, people asked for us to prioritise a variety of things, families, people with disabilities, etc. Those things may require physical changes to the properties, making them more accessible or making them larger for families. Most of our units are one bedroom. A decision on age doesn't affect the physical building, um, whether they're over 65 or over 55, the building doesn't need to change. So from that perspective, there's little work the team would need to do if council made that change or didn't. If council chose to prioritise families or people with disabilities, as some of the submissions asked for, that would require some physical changes to the buildings. Let me, if I can just jump in. I think the broader question that the Mayor is asking is, um, will that have any impact on us managing the portfolio in the meantime? And the answer is no. Yeah. We can manage it exactly as we have been. Um, the thing that council will need to do is make 
some kind of um, decision on the various submissions because we have asked a specific question, so it, whether that's to ask for more work or something like that, but we do need to make a decision on the question. Yeah, that's helpful, actually. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Lofisal and then Councillor O'Malley. Tenako, Your Worship. Tenako, Rua. Um, I think my question is maybe for the CEO. I've been looking at the summary of considerations, uh, particularly with respect to Tangata Whenua, um, and it said that Māori housing, uh, there's going to be discussions with Mātāwaka and Mana Whenua about the needs of uh, Māori <coughs> residents. And it, for me, it's um, also... Uh, conflated, if you like, with the whakapapa of tenants um, and that we don't collect that. But is this is this something that's going to be managed by um, the mana hotu position? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I've got two questions. One is around paragraph nine and the people on the waiting lists as it relates to over 65. So we've got basically approximately well, 250 people on the waiting list, of which 45, so let's just for simplicity's sake, half are over the age of 65. If we could build four units a year uh, per million, then we've got 40 units with the 10 and 80 units with the 80, if, if that's the achievable number. Is the occupancy number one or two or three? It's usually one point something, isn't it? The number of people in the units. Yeah, the majority will be... Um, single people living alone. We do have some couples, so yeah, we're slightly higher than one. Generally speaking, though, for rough calculation, it's more or less one then, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have over 65 already, around about 120 people-ish sitting on the waiting list. Correct. Yep. And we would propose to build between 40 and 80 units, depending on whether you go to 10 or 20. That's the question that was asked in the consultation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, I'm just, the, the context is that even if we fund the 20, we probably are not funding enough units to feed what's already on the waiting list. Correct, yeah. And we expect that number to grow, right? It's a reasonable assumption, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, now there's, to page. Oh, sorry, I mean, there's a slight complication in that we also know that some of the people that are on our waiting list will also be on the social housing registry. Uh, and Kainga or have a more expensive building program over this over the short term. We also know that there'll be people in need who are on neither list, so it's it's hard to it's hard to get exact numbers of what the demand is at any point of time. I mean, your point's well made, but it's it's. But we're my not the point only... really, my question point is um, that it's it's will it will if we went even to the twenty, we would go a long way down that list. But we, based on the fact that there's others who are not on the list, and why there might be double. Booking in some cases, we're probably reasonable to assume that that number's somewhere near the truth in terms of requirement, and therefore, even at the upper limit of spend, we probably have an expectation of, of not meeting all the requirements for those who need it over 65. Ish. I mean, it's hard to say what will happen in 10 years. The waiting list looked very different 10 years ago. It's no expectation it will go down, though, is there? I mean, even in the report, it says that, the for that age term, group, though. it would expect to go up. And I want to get back to point 18, um, which is the revenue and expenditure data set. And while the operating surplus is 600, uh, 660,000, I know this is $2 million worth of depreciation in there. So the EBITDA, if we did that before we applied the depreciation, it would look like they're not running at a loss. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. If you didn't include depreciation, then... And the depreciation has an assumption of replacement in it. I guess the question is, again, the, the calculation of the depreciation amount, because if it was quite literally $600,000 less, $1.4 I we feel like we're all searching towards the finance desk. Yeah. <laughs> so just in note 19, we, we tried to make reference to, to yeah. how the depreciation is calculated. I see that. Fundamentally, that depreciation is the money that, that needs to be collected in order to do the renewals. If the renewals is not correct, collected on a yearly basis from the rent, then the renewals would have to be funded from another source, potentially debt. 
renewals being new builds to replace old builds because you've no. got an operations and maintenance budget no no this is this is where you do that you're remodeling so we're doing a couple at the moment as a poem mara where we're actually having to refit the units so the the units are still existing units but they're having to be re refurbished beyond just a, just a paint on the wall so, so it's that's like renewing kitchens renewing bathrooms oh yeah i get it yeah. Yeah. just why is that not in the operation and maintenance because it's capital in nature, because effectively what you're doing is you're extending the life of the unit. Okay, so it's not then a straight depreciation calculation in terms of asset write down, it's actually also there's a capital spend in that depreciation number. The depreciation is the write down of the existing asset. We revalue the asset on a three yearly basis. What that does is provide us the funding to do both, to do the capital renewals. So this is the renewing of the components of the building. So when you paint a wall, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's operating. When you renew a bathroom, you're effectively renewing a component of the building to extend the life of the, of the building. So therefore, that is a capital in nature. OK, so therefore, do we then capture that the building eventually gets the end of life and we demolish it and have to build a new one in that depreciation calculation as well? Effectively, there is an element of that, yes. OK, cool. Um, well, that that then does effectively mean then that that is actually an ongoing cost that is not an EBITDA. I mean, I know it's depreciation, but in fact we are actually spending money in real time. Correct. Thank you. Councillor Lord. I don't know if this is an easy question to answer, but I just, over the years I have been into at least three or four different council flats, and it seems to me that the quality does vary a bit. And um, what I'm trying to assess is how much below, or how much uh, below the um, market rates do you think we are, and would it apply that we, like some seem to me incredibly good buying at say 110, 115 a week or whatever, and others seem that would be closer to what they're worth, if you know what I mean. Is there an estimate of how far below market rates we are but like if we were to consider raising rates somewhat and i don't mean by 50 percent or anything like that but if we were gonna how far below a market rate do you think we are um the market rates uh, referred to in here are you know for a one bedroom unit in dunedin have, have gone up to about 300 bucks a week um so we're so even even the poorest of those units that we've got, and I say poorest a bit carefully, but um, even the ones that have got the least nice features, um, they would still be worth that on the market rates. Well, there's obviously a huge variation, as, as you indicate, between yeah. you know nearly a thousand units. There's a wide variation. So, so would there be an option to charge more for the better units? Do we have to have a fixed rate right across all single bedroom units? Um, that's a decision for council, I think, that will be reflected in the policy work that will come back to council. Yes, all right, all right. yeah, I do, I do understand that too, but what I mean is, do you, like, you, you know all the flats, you, this is your area of expertise, do you think we could consider that as a, as a reasonable option? It, that we it, break them into tiers of perhaps the very best to the middle, to the bottom, and the ones that are in the bottom wouldn't get much of a rise, the others could get a moderate rise, or a, a smaller rise, and then a... So, so some councils across New Zealand do charge their rents uh, based on market rent, some charge it based on the income of the tenant. Yeah. Um, so there are, there are options for council to consider. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hall. You build price for a house of a quarter of a million dollars. Have we got enough sections to do that, or are we going to start purchasing land to put these on over the next 10 years? Um, with, with 10 million over the, over the 10 years, um, we probably do have enough land with infill at existing sites. Mm -hmm. um, as you get higher, it's possible we'd need to look at acquiring more land towards the end of the 10 years. So that would more than double the price of a unit? If we had to buy the land, depending on the land cost, potentially. But, but also, we do have various land holdings um, that we we could look at. There's one site in particular that we've identified that we can potentially put 20 units on, for example. So we just have to start looking at things that um, may not have been considered in the past. So the, yeah, 
there's a lot of work to be done, and it was a point that I did want to make. Um, it's highly unlikely that we will be able to build 80 units in the next year, for example. So there is a delay in our ability to actually find the sites, design and plan up the work. And so councillors just need to be aware of that. Yeah, I had a question on that just to, to follow on. At what point subsequent to us making decisions here would we have a sense of what is possible in the over that 10 year period, acknowledging that the shorter term answers are probably more easy to define than the medium term ones? Take us a little bit of time to sit down and identify land in need, but what do you think, David? Three months? We we, we've, we've got a certain, certainly the, the one million a year option, we'd have a decent idea of where we'd be building um, already and, and where those sites would be. Yeah, or, or, um, or if, it w if, you went, if it was $2 million a year over the next few years, at least, you'd have some sense. I'm just trying to get a sense of will, will we even do this if there's money in next year's budget to be able to do it? Yep, the, the planning's already underway, as, as, as the Chief has indicated, it takes a couple of months to finish that off, but the planning's underway to start the work straight away. Okay, thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at point 38, um, and it references Dave's point as well. Some submitters felt that the best way to solve the housing issue was for council to work in partnership with other providers, e.g. Kainga or NGOs, iwi, to develop a wide range of housing options, and Abbey Field was one of those who put in as well. Um, and I note at point 39, Neither option precludes council from working with other housing providers. And I was just wondering, have other housing pro providers approached you for partnership other than like Abbey Field or something? So, oh. and so yes. So at the minute, um, I'm working directly with Kainga Ora on a um, MOU about how we might work in a more joined up way. I've, and the teams have had conversations with a variety of other um, social housing providers. So that's partly how we're trying to approach this. We're not going to be able to solve the um, housing yeah. issues across the city on our own. So we're looking at being enablers and supporting other people who have um, different tools available to, to deal with some of the issues. My second question related to that is, would those kind of partners Ships enable us to actually um, produce a lot more houses with, uh, with a, I mean, it's more bang for your buck, I well, suppose. Well, we can do what we can um, with the, uh, the money and the direction that Council gives us for our social housing, but it's about trying to provide complementary offerings of housing because there are different needs, as the submissions showed that there's a wide variety of mm. need in the community, and it's about trying to provide that... Um, that suite of, of housing. And it may be that in, in working with those providers, we do, um, and I'm just say we might do 55 plus, they may do um, affordable housing for families. So it's just working through that. So have we thought also, um, as part of this process, being in a partnership arrangement with a community pro housing provider as well? Or have they approached you at all? Uh, we, as, as the Chief Executive's outlined, we've had a lot of discussions with a lot of different groups. Um, you'll be aware that Property are working uh, on a report regarding the Housing Action Plan, uh, which is uh, really um, will cover off some of those um, pieces of work. And I think we will be having a report back to committee fairly shortly on that. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. Councillor Reddick. Uh, I'm curious about the, the rental shortfall to break even, because that, um, you know, has that been a decision of council on each year when it's happened, or has it just happened? Because I notice looking at the table on page uh, 54 and item 33, it's only an average of $4 a year to keep pace. It has been a decision of council in that the rents are set by council as part of fees and charges, so a, a conscious decision has been made by council each year to fund this at lower than what it would cost to meet the policy requirements. Yeah. Yes, so that was my question. Oh, well, that was a question. Um, 
it seems to be a relatively small amount. Uh, and yet as policy, yeah, it seems a relatively small amount to increase it each year to keep it at break even, which would you know, fund all those renewals. Um, and similarly, our market rents now are quite a long way. Well, our, the rentals we are offering are much less than market rents. If we would put up the, our rents by the $15 to bring it up to a break even, which is still an arbitrary figure relative to the market, do you, do you have any uh, notion, any idea of how that would affect the wait list? I can't imagine so. I don't think we can easily answer that. Um, um, I, we wouldn't be able to uh, second guess what that would uh, mean for demand. Well, it would depend how close you were to the market, like how mm. much you were. It's probably, a, it's probably a question for economists in terms of what the elasticity of demand is for public housing units, Council. Well, it depends how in touch but you anyway, are with do, do you have a, speaking do you have a, tenants. Do you have questions right. for staff? That's all right. All right, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Did we used to have 943 properties or units? Um, the, the 936 number is, is the number of units currently available, so there'll be a, a, a few that are currently unavailable. So oh, OK, so we previously we did have 943. We, yeah. We previously right. had quite... I know, well, we're well, going better. Yeah, I thought yeah. we did. And we had, what, 996 or something at Yeah, you'll point? have seen higher numbers at oh, various right. times. Yes. Yeah. And then we council made a decision to... Um, sell some to another social housing provider. Oh. So they remained as social housing, but just not ones that we were using. Did we sell, so we've sold some off to bring us down to this, to the 936 from the 943 recently, have we? No, 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 no we've from 996. Oh, right, okay, thank you. Do we know um, if any of our, they probably, I mean, obviously we don't want to say their names or anything like that, but if any of our tenants over the time have been homeless that we've taken in? Um, we, we don't provide that er, immediate um, emergency housing for, for homeless people, yes. but certainly some of our tenants have previously been homeless, yeah. Right, okay, so, because that's what I wondered if, if we're, I mean, obviously if there's such a serious need, it's, it's you know, needed and not wanted in our city for people to be homeless, um, but is it, that's what I, I suppose, that, that really comes under the emergency services, doesn't it, which goes to, go, is that government that would normally do that? Okay, thank I th you. I, th I think it's probably, it's a, it's a point worth clarifying that um, council aren't, we are not a social housing provider. Um, social housing providers provide places for people to live, but also support for the tenants. We are a <laughs> landlord of public housing uh, that we keep at, a, at, a, at affordable rentals and that's a pretty key distinction and, mm. and it's not and it's not well understood in the public arena of obviously and it's reflected in some of the submissions that we've had you know that we should be providing these services but we uh, but we currently don't but I just, I just wanted to it's, it's relevant to your question around emergency housing yes. which is something that is facilitated and, and funded by largely by MSD and delivered by the Salvation Army and in, in Dunedin I think. When you say that we're landlords um that's a, a good point. We can I clarify? We have no mortgages over any of these units, do we? Is that correct? correct. Right. And yet, for the last ten years, we've lost income and lost money on the. Is that correct? Yes. Um, okay. Just to clarify, builders. I mean, builders are very hard to get, but we must have a team ready and waiting, do we? We, we have a, a panel of uh, building companies. Yeah. Right. So we've got no concern about resources to build these. Is, we're not going to have a Kiwi build situation here, are we? Uh, I would hope not, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm actually getting just to the question of the word use of the word subsidy. Um, so on page 305 of our documents are the fees and charges for our housing, and then page 306 are the fees and charges for Moana Pool. Now we offset the input to Moana Pool. Do we use the term subsidy when we talk about subsidise, when we talk about offsets of rates recovery on other things? No, I just, because it is relevant to the debate and I do need to make sure that we are using the correct semantics as we're going forward, that's all. That's the reason I'm asking that question. 
and and likewise through the levels of service, I would assume that these are ascribed a value in terms of public benefit versus private benefit, which is how those sorts of things which are would, calculated. Which I guess will come into the debate, and that's why I wanted to bring up the word subsidies and subsidise as we've as we've characterised it in the consult consultation document. So we don't tend to use the word subsidise in other places where we offset the charge as it, with a community good or a community use, like like for instance a swimming pool. Mr Logie. But maybe we just need to refer to the revenue and financing policy where we stipulate the public benefit versus private. So for housing it's 100 per cent private at this stage. So um, effectively what we're at, what, in terms of the, the use of the term rates funded would, would, would probably mean that we would require to change that revenue and financing policy and say that we expect the public benefit for that portfolio to be X per cent. And that's how we, and then it, then it gets in the, in the registry and, and the calculations in that way. So it's, it's the public private. Good, thank you very much. Um, and then my other question is whatever we decide in terms of funding this, um, could, if, if, we, if we're doing, let's say, one million a year and we come up with a situation that we can have an opportunity to build so many units and it's going to cost four million, do we have the ability to move that money up and down on the timeline? Yes, we do. Good, thank you. Councillor Barker. Most of my questions have been answered, which is great. I just wondered um, about where people are coming into community housing. For every person that comes in, are they actually freeing up, let's say, a four bedroom house, for example? Would there be many examples of people downsizing from their own homes, or have we sort of got means testing before people come in? Correct. They need, they need to meet a, an asset threshold. So yeah, if they were selling a four-bedroom family home, they wouldn't meet our priority one criteria in terms of their assets. So if they were moving into our DCC housing, they wouldn't necessarily be freeing up a house, but maybe freeing up a home. They'll, they'll be coming from a range of places. So. Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you. Um, we've had parts of the answer um, to, to key question, um, and it may be that Mr. West can elaborate um, in terms of what's planned in terms of the housing action plan, but this is probably a question for the Chief Executive in the context of quite a lot of infill housing that we see around the suburbs as a result of um, zoning decisions. To say nothing of the big projects, we know there's no great pool of um, happy carpenters out there desperately um, trying to find something to do. Um, so my question is obviously about the actual capacity, irrespective of what we budget, there are some major constraints about delivery. Um, and I'd just like um, to get a better feel for what we could actually deliver in any one year, irrespective of this overreach decision. Um, can we? Can we build a million dollars worth or two million dollars worth of units at the quoted prices in a year? Is that actually achievable? I think early on in the 10 years, probably. Um, it's probably achievable. As you start to get out two, three, four years into the market, then I, we would just have to see. A, a, the interesting bit of what you said uh, was the at the um, quoted price, because if there is a shortage of builders, then it's the price that will, that will attract them, and so that that will be the the tension. At the minute, um, we could probably we could roll out um, what the, the ten million dollars worth. I think, David. Yeah, just to give councillors some, some further reassurance, I guess the the two housing projects that are currently underway, so a refurbishment at Palmyra, and and the renewal of the School Street site, um, combined, we're probably spending about five hundred k a month. Um, as, as those two projects are well into construction. And can I follow that up, please, Mr Chairman? That is that it likely, is that workforce that we're using, say, at Palmyra and wherever else, a uh, workforce that is suited to construction of new build, or are they just retrofitting existing? So Palmyra is a, is a refurbishment to existing. The School Street site did involve the demolition and new build. Okay. <laughs> So there would be the potential for continuity of work for a, a 
dedicated work, a discrete workforce doing this work on new such buildings for us. Correct. We'd follow our procurement rules to procure the right company. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is around that as well. If we ended up um, with the two million a year, what um, chance of that price? If we had, you know, obviously it's more buildings. Does that mean it sounded like before you were saying that that would mean we'd need to buy land to to supply, you know, to service those that amount? Is that correct? Not necessarily, but it's a possibility, certainly towards the end of the 10-year right. period. And my next question is, um, the obvious question is the money side of that. Would that still mean we'd, if we have to buy the land that would stay in that budget of the $2 million? If there was um, a need for us to purchase land, then we would come back to Council, because um, that, that delegation for the purchase of land of that value sits with Council. Right, but it would mean... it. Would going outside the budget of the two million? Potentially, but we, there's a bit of work for us to do to identify chunks of land that we have that might be suitable and we yes. haven't necessarily done that. And um, infilling existing sites, thinking about alternative ways that we might design for slightly um, you know, dense in living. Yes. And the 250,000 that um, you've estimated it would cost to build a unit, is that... Um, s I'm just wondering, like, if there's pressure on the market with the hospital build, obviously, and a lot of development in our city, is it likely to go up? Building costs. It it, it would. It's very much an estimate, and it, yeah, it, it's very much an estimate, and it would depend massively on site and a range of other factors. It's very likely, is there? Well, I just yes. refer to the chief executive's previous comment, which was uh, in response to Councillor Benson Pope, which was. Um, it, it's hard for us to predict on that, um, but it, it depends on d demand. Uh, and if demand were to increase, then it might be reasonable to assume that costs might go up to attract those um, those um, builders. Yes, it's very hard to get builders. Thank you, Councillor Elder. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at um, increase from previous year list on page 54. And six of the last 10 years, we have not put up the rentals. And I note that in 2019, we put them up one to three dollars per week, which is a sort of an incremental step up. What um, my question is around actually the accommodation supplement, and should we put our rents up? Do people? Will people's accommodation supplement cover the, the increase in rent so that they're not penalised for that increase? So everybody can apply for the accommodation supplement and those rates have changed. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering about how much they're penalised if we put it up incrementally, like every year or something. Um, it, it would depend on a range of factors. Many of our tenants uh, do receive the accommodation supplement, but it depends on the individual circumstances and the rent being charged. But yes, broadly speaking, if their rent goes up, they would likely receive more accommodation supplement. It wouldn't cover the whole increase, but it would it would probably cover some of it. Yes, yeah, so do you know how much it would cover of a incremental because they can reapply and they can say my worth, rent's gone up i think it's worth asking um getting clarification of this my understanding is that the accommodation supplement is a fixed figure depending on where you live uh, and so if you live in dunedin then you qualify for up to a cap of x and and those limits are periodically reviewed um, but not particularly periodically, if, if, if you catch my point. But we can get um, clarification yes. around the current policy settings and have that. Yeah, I'm, my well. impression is that we're in Region 3 and the cap is reasonably high because they've had to change them. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not... Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship, and this has been partially answered, but I just want to check something with you. Um, so we've been unpicking the various uncertainties 
And I would assume and ask you um, if the supply issue for building materials has impacted yet on School Street and is that likely to be a big fact, particularly in regards to the freight and container charges that we're hearing about that have gone up astronomically? Have we seen that come through on the School Street site at all and are you concerned about that going forward? We, we've not seen that yet at School Street, certainly, no. But it would be one of the uncertainties in this... There are supply chain and, and supply challenges ac across the industry. I've not seen that massively impact in Dunedin as yet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wiley. Yep, thank you. Um, just thinking back to the 20th of May uh, budget, um, what, in, what uh, effect would that have had on our residents? Um, so I'd, I'd refer you to the report in um, paragraph 23, so the, the affordability table 2, um, that has been amended to reflect the changes announced at the budget meeting last week, week 4. Yep, so for those that are following the, the meeting uh, online, can you just expand upon that a little bit please? Uh, so there was an increase announced to the job seeker benefit which is reflected in the table. Okay. All right. Um, looking at high street housing, um, we invested in that. Do we still own um, how many units and at what value? Um, council is committed to purchasing one unit. They've yet to receive code of compliance certificate, so we haven't completed that purchase yet. Um, but it'll be one one unit. Okay. And what was the what's the approximate value of that unit? I, I... The agreed purchase price was six hundred and seventy-five k. Okay, and is that a plan to hold that or sell it? As is it there's a council it? resolution that we um, sell it, but you know, that, so that's the existing council resolution. Okay, and then thank you for that. Um, when we look at what we consulted on, are we actually spending enough in upgrading our current units, uh, noting that such a large percentage is pre 1980, and um, you know. I can gather that some people listening to this meeting or watching it at a later date will go, actually, here they're talking about new units, but my unit is crap and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I agree. Pre-1970 is better. <laughs> um, the, the, as as uh, Mr Logie was referring to earlier, the depreciation amount of, of $2 million a year is used to uh, upgrade and renew the existing units. Okay, um, but are we doing enough in that space? And when we look at the units around the city, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer, Councillor. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. Right. So, um, do we have a, a satisfaction report from the residents um, saying that they feel they're, you know, eighty percent feel that they're they're living in a warm, healthy home. Yeah, so we do a, a, a tenant satisfaction survey and it's reported quarterly to the Infrastructure Services Committee. Um, we're averaging above 90% in terms of tenant satisfaction with their unit. Okay, thank you. Um, and then when we look at uh, focusing on um, the, un the new building new units, um, uh, I note that nearly all of our units uh, are mostly single storey. Are we really considering multi-storey using greater effect of the land, similar to what we've done in variation two of the two GP? Um, I guess one of the, the challenges with building multi-storey for us will be the type of tenants that we look after, and, and you know, currently it's over 55 who we prioritise. If council were to change that to over 65, um, the wisdom of building multi-storey walk-up units uh, for older and older people. Um, would be, be challenging. But, um, but we'll we will look at options, and so we do need to start to be a little bit creative mm. about um, density. how we build, and about density and about solutions for how we, we do that. Um, so while we haven't historically um, had terribly many units that are double story, we just need to start looking at what, it, what might be the best use of the land that we have available. And given, and given the commitments that have been made around universal design of all new builds, all of that accessibility question would be taken into account there as well. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Raddick. Yes, um, 
Well, they're questioning about the priority groups. We've got four priority groups currently. And so the question we're considering is to whether to include a fifth or would it be just one only priority group and the, those four being scrapped? Um, the decisions made will uh, so be reflected in a policy that we brought back to council, but I think one option would be to keep four priority groups and simply change the age criteria. So priority one, currently 55 and over, uh, could potentially become 65 and over, and then priority three and four would be 64 and under. Right, so it's not just pre-decided at the stage? No, there's How still a lot of work to do in reviewing the, the policy and strategy, and that will be brought back to Council at a later date. Sure. So do we have any information on the demographics of our current tenants? You know, how they fit into those four priority groups? And alternatively, how they were uh, selected or allocated a unit based on those priority groups, which, of course, may well change depending how long they've been in the units. Um, certainly the majority of our tenants would fit in that priority one group. The vast majority of our tenants are aged over 55 and on low income. And further to the new priority group five, or you know, I'm just calling it five for the sake of it, aged over 65, would that be also the case? Yeah, we do have the exact figures. Um, it, it's certainly the majority. I believe it's about two thirds of our tenant rates are over 65 and on low income. Right. But there is a third. That's quite a lot. Oh, well, it strikes me as quite a lot. A third below 65. I'd, I'd need to check the exact numbers. Thank you. Sorry, <coughs> Councillor Lofisal. Tēnāko, Your Worship. Tēnāko, Rua. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, uh, forgive my lack of concentration, and and it's fine if you don't. Um, if you're not able to answer this question because it's not actually in the report, but um, just from your expertise, um, how many, on average, a year, how many um, dwellings do we, of our dwellings, do we have unoccupied? Um, our, our occupancy rate is, is really high. It's around about 97, 98%. And Aroha Mai, um, forgive me, uh, Your Worship, or uh, the CE, I'm just coming out of left field here in terms of the problem and noting that the 2018 census figures say that we've got 7.4% uh, of our Dunedin City houses unoccupied. Would there be any merit long term or short term of lobbying central government for a tax for unoccupied houses? The merits or otherwise of any advocacy effort would probably extend beyond the scope of this paper, uh, but it's certainly a conversation that is worth ha having at a national level. Um, it's, it's, it's more pointedly expressed in larger metropolitan areas than this one. Thanks. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Risha. I'm just um, referring to attachment A when it talks about the Dunedin City Social Housing Strategy and the Mayor referred to it earlier about the definition of social housing versus community housing. And I just really want to clarify that Council is in the business of providing community housing. Um, social housing is a broad spectrum. Um, the Mayor was referring to the fact that we don't provide social services. Um, We've called our public housing community housing. It's just the name we've chosen to give it. Okay, I think people get a bit confused about that. And ref going back to this report as well, I just wonder what the, um, given that the strategy is 2010, I just wonder um, under the strategic framework update, what is the, when we, might we expect an update on this strategy? So, um, Councillor, the decisions that Council make today. Uh, will inform the next phase of that work uh, and I think in the next steps they vary depending on uh, whether it fits under the policy or the strategy but we would be hope to be back with council um, um, prior to the end of the year. I just wonder and maybe this question for the um, chief executive is around um, 
<laughs> strategies versus plans, <laughs> which is, uh, I guess, because here we have a, a social housing strategy that's 11 years old, and I just wonder what the overall arching process, we've got a housing action plan, etc., and how all of that fits together and where we're going in the future. And, and it is tricky to make them all fit together. And so this document predated the strategic framework, so that's why it's a strategy. Um, and, and so we have um, tried to tighten up on the, st on the strategy framework now, and the um, piece of work that um, was endorsed last week by Council, the plan will now look at what we do more broadly. Part of that will be to align up policies or plans or whatever flow from the main strategies, and, and clear naming and a clear hierarchy will be part of that because it's really confusing. And in the same way that we have consolidated strategies, we'll look to consolidate that policy framework as well because there's too many. Um, and just to simplify it, so each strategy will have good, clear policies and plans that flow from them. Uh, so that, that's part of that work. And it was one of the work streams, I think, in the, in the framework that you approved last week. So this would almost fit, un almost fit under the social wellbeing strategy? Housing is part of that, and, but also with it, how we integrate the, um, the thriving cities model. So clearly housing is part of being, uh, having thriving communities, and so it just all needs to be pulled together, and the project plan will look at that. So yeah, they, all, they all fit together. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. I'm just looking at if we were to go with prioritising the people over the age of 65, we're not going to have a perverse outcome where people who are under the age of 65 who are current tenants would end up losing their tenancy. So the tenancy is continuous and it's not No, it's by proposed just for the waiting list and new applicants. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. I couldn't hear that for a second. Did you have a microphone on? Um, I was just checking. Um, just to clarify, if the rents increase by $15 a week, um, does that mean we'd still need to subsidise in rates? Um, it, it, so I'd, I'd refer you to, to paragraph 21 there. So yes. it, it's very much an average. We do charge a range of different rents, um, right. but in, in very broad terms to, to close that deficit of 659000 and become break-even, um, a $15 a week average increase would be what's required, yeah. And so even, you know, if we have that increase, do we still need to, are they still being subsidised by rates? No, that, that would allow it to break even. Right, so we'd have no, rates wouldn't be used at all. Uh, that's, that's the hope. Under the current budgets, yes, for okay. next year. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Um, what is the turnover situation on the wait list? Because we have them now in these four priorities, but how often do, it, what is the rate of uh, movement into housing? And what is the rate of uh, people dropping off the wait list because they've found alternative accommodation? And thirdly, part, third part of that, where are they all? You know, because some of the, I'm, expecting that they will have been on the wait list for some time because the wait list is so high. Where are all these people sitting waiting? Um, to, to answer your first question, uh, we house, it varies from month to month, but um, anywhere between five and 15 people a month. Um, yeah, about, about 10 would be about average uh, people housed off the waiting list. Um, we also review the waiting list uh, six monthly, uh, and a number of people will, will drop off because they've moved to a different city or found alternative housing or their circumstances have changed. Um, and I'm sorry, councillor, you had a third question. You, can you repeat it? Where are those people? Do you have any data or any idea where those people are accommodated in the meantime? Um, we do ask them where, in terms of their current living situation, do you mean? Yes. Oh, there'll be a, a, a range um, of, of people from, uh, some of them will be in uh, transitional housing, some of them will be in, in uh, private rentals. Um, yeah, but you, you don't keep any data on that. It's just a matter of information. It's not. We, we take it when we take their application. 
I don't have it to hand, no, sorry. Right. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, well, it's my intention to move a range of responses to the various questions that have been asked, but I'm conscious, um, one, that nobody has seen them, and two, that well, once we get into debate, I assume there'll be some discussion uh, about these. So I'm going to move that we adjourn the meeting for morning tea. Now, seconded Councillor Walker and come back at 10.30. Thank you.
Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, the resolution should be on your screen. Anon. It's going to struggle to fit on one page. My apologies. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks. In, in speaking to these, uh, and I'm happy to take these uh, separately, but I'll speak to them uh, collectively. Um, I think it's uh, it's helpful to take the opportunity to look more broadly at how we deal with our waiting list criteria. Um, we asked a very particular question around how old someone should be before they qualify for uh, one of our housing units, and we've received a, a number of submissions uh, through the public feedback process that have asked us to consider uh, whether it's people with impairment issues or Māori and Pacifica tenants or whatever another uh, group where there is point, more pointed housing need might be. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not comfortable making a decision on that at this point, um, but would uh, would request that account for the, the subsequent um, uh, recommendations and I'm comfortable knowing that this wouldn't stop the work happening. Um, B, uh, to, to support rates revenue being used to subsidise rents for DCC's community housing. I'm, I'm pleased that the rates and um, the rates funding policy was mentioned uh, earlier on in response to questions. I, I, and I understand that this will largely be a philosophical argument, uh, but I, I don't agree that uh, public housing is something that is, carries close to, if not 100% private benefit uh, for the tenant. Uh, the clue is in the name. Uh, it is public housing and there is value uh, to us as a, as a community and as a society in providing uh, affordable, um, healthy rental accommodation to people on low and fixed incomes. Uh, and and, and I'm, I'm completely supportive of uh, the revenue of this body that is collected from our community at large being used to maintain the affordability of those rental units for people on low and fixed incomes. Um, there's no short, we've got a very clear steer from our community around um, how ambitious they want us to be in terms of building new units and, and $20 million regardless of what the how the construction costs might fall in any given year um, isn't particularly ambitious but it does give us a shot at meeting the a target that we once had uh, of having a housing portfolio closer to uh, 1,000 units. We haven't um, built any uh, in a number of years and at the same time the need certainly is only heading in one direction. Uh, and while um, it's it's great for um, to have the support of government through Kainga Ora and, and adding to the supply that they have here locally, uh, I think that we have a uh, we have a, a duty to play our part in expanding the portfolio that we have uh, in, in, over the next 10 year period and of the two options that we asked for uh, feedback on, either 10 million over the 10 years or 20 million uh, over the 10 years, uh, the higher figure uh, certainly sits uh, more comfortably with me and I was surprised actually at the degree of um, support uh, for that alternative option uh, through the public feedback process uh, and all of that really just um, pointing to the fact that more work will be done in terms of the housing action plan and the community housing policy and strategy or whatever it ends up being called uh, to fit in with our, our strategic framework uh, refresh and the various uh, actions that fall out of that to deliver on uh, the, the aspirations that we have uh, as, a, as a council and as a community. And to some degree, the existing uh, policy and strategy has been superseded by uh, our social wellbeing strategy and, our, and, and the various iterations of the housing action plan and the, the mayoral task force for housing and any number of things. And it's worth uh, noting that council's position in adopting the housing action plan is to focus our efforts uh, where there is the greatest need. Uh, and affordable rental properties uh, for people on low and fixed incomes is certainly um, 
in the scale of on the housing spectrum is the area of of greatest need, and, and that is why uh, I support us investing in uh, expanding the provision uh, for those uh, people in our, our community over the 10-year period. Further speakers, Councillor Vanderbilt. Council, as a landlord, has very significant advantages over private landlords. We uh, the, the DCC has a large stock of significant economies of scale. The large stock of housing we already have, some 900 units, means that we can much more efficiently, because of economies of scale, maintain those units and organise rental agreements, etc. We also, as the DCC, have uh, significant land holdings um, to develop, uh, which again, your private landlords don't have the luxury of. And thirdly, and probably much more to the point, the DCC as a landlord doesn't need to make a profit on its community housing. All of these three major significant advantages together mean that the DCC should be able to, without any ratepayer further funding, they should be able to supply significantly reduced rentals for the some 900 units that we currently have. If we wish to go outside of what used to be essentially a self-financing system, and we want to go beyond losing the opportunity cost of having 60 million or whatever it is now invested in our community housing and start to ask ratepayers to subsidise other uh, users of community housing. We are, I believe, creating a new kind of problem. The problem is we already have tens of thousands of people living in Dunedin who have difficulty uh, paying for their electricity bill in the winter. Um, I have anecdotal reports of people not getting out of bed in the winter because they can't afford to heat their flat. These are all ratepayers, many of whom have worked all their lives and uh, paid for their own houses and are now trying to have a reasonably comfortable old age. And in this proposal here, B and C, we are asking them, tens of thousands of them, to subsidise a thousand community houses beyond what we already subsidise them with by way of the opportunity costs that are already invested in social housing. We have in the past been able to build more social housing because of the, the uh, profits that we were able to get from our existing social housing stock. And the suggestion that suddenly now uh, we can no longer do this comes back to the issue of, well, are we running our social housing efficiently? And are we charging appropriate rents? The idea that a $15 increase in rent would get us back to what we used to have, and that is a self-sustaining community housing uh, uh, pool, uh, is one which I think we should look at seriously. And if we aren't, if we are going to continue with such incredibly much lower rents than uh, the current market rentals, that this becomes a problem in itself and that it starts to skew the whole market rental situation. We are, in creating these far cheaper uh, uh, community housing situations, creating uh, downward pressure on private rentals by way of competition. And we're asking the owners of private houses to subsidise essentially their own 
um, disadvantage. So for those reasons, I can vote for A and D, not a problem. But B and C take community housing into an entirely new level, which I don't think we can philosophically or financially justify. Councillor Elder. Well, I hope this is a less expensive iteration of that, thankfully. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, yes, under normal situations, um, I don't know what you can call normal, but I wouldn't be voting for this because right now I, I, I just don't think we can justify keeping increasing our rates. And um, so, however, we're not in a normal situation. We have a major housing crisis in Dunedin and probably around the rest of the country, truth be known. I got told the other day that there's more than 900 new students coming out from the university next year. They'll all be looking for houses. I don't know where they're going to go. Um, for student landlords, I mean, that's great news. But um, what it does, it's putting pressure on our market. We also, over the next 10 years, have the, as we all know, the hospital build, um, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on our builders. Um, with this list we have here, A to D, I, I'm actually feeling the same way as Councillor Vandivis. A, um, I can look at staff, so yeah, to look at the waiting list for the criteria. Um, I cannot support B, which is having a rates review being you, revenue being used to subsidise rents. My understanding is, from the questions we had here, but I wasn't part of council previously, so I might be wrong on this, but my understanding is that previous councils had intended that the community housing um, was, uh, you know, neutral, so that it met, covered its own costs. Now, we've been told that from the last 15 years, 10 of those years out of 15, it didn't do it. A simple measure of putting up the rent by, what did we hear, maybe $4 a year or, you know, each year, so $4 a week, would have covered that and had it meeting the meeting it's covering all its costs as I hear it. I don't know whether that's correct or not, but that's my understanding. If that had been done, we wouldn't have to have this jump of $15 a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but to a lot of these people who are in these homes, it probably is a lot. Um, but if on B, we can say that it's neutral and it won't cost ratepayers any money, I'm happy to support it if it covers itself. These properties have no mortgages, the only costs we have, we get rents from them, and the only cost is the upkeep. I mean, I personally, I've said it numerous times, cannot understand how we continue to lose money on these properties. Um, so in C, that 20 million will be um, included in the 10-year plan. What we heard today as well in the question time is that if we go for the option of 20 million, while we have a major housing shortage, um, we're going to have an issue because that means we'll be building up to 80 houses over that time, over a 10-year period. We probably won't have the land. For that, we'll have to find or buy land or do some deal to get more land. So that's going to cost us more. We've got the increased cost of building over that time, so I don't believe we're going to meet those budgets. Um, also, we heard that whatever we build uh, around the 1 million or the 2 million, we're not going to get anywhere near the amount of people. We've got 170 people already on a waiting list, so we're not going to cover that. So, um, but we will make a difference for the people that we can provide. So I could agree to um, the, the 10 million, which would be four houses a year, so 40 houses over the 10 years, I believe. Once again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's the figures. And then, um, so B and C at the moment, I won't agree with for those reasons. D, um, that notes the decisions, well, that makes sense. Anything we have there will contribute to our housing policy. I think what's happened is over a long period of time, um, this government and 
uh, previous governments have contributed to the problem by not building enough houses. But of course, costs are going up. It's not necessarily the government's fault. Um, we're going to have the same problems. Uh, building resources are expensive. There's a, a, I heard a shortage on, on wood for building. There's definitely a shortage on builders. You can't get a builder for love or money. If anyone knows a good one, could they get hold of me? I need one. But, um, you know, it's really difficult. And we're going to find that over the next 10 years, those costs will go up and up. So I don't believe those budgets we put there are realistic. And we'll end up going over budget because we'll commit to the projects. And then somehow it'll just be... Um, put back into the huge pool that is an unending, like a diving pool of overrun budgets that are just getting higher and higher and higher. That's your five minutes, Councillor, perfectly timed. Councillor Hall. In C, could we add an extra couple of words in there, being an average of $2 million per annum? So if we end up with a $4 million development, we can take it from the, the next year's budget and that'll give us more flexibility in the spending. Would that make sense? Uh, we're in debate, Councillor. I can try and respond <laughs> in due course. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you and for, for being the mover of, um, uh, of these recommendations, and also for Part A, I particularly like, because um, that was something certainly in the recommendation earlier that was making me, me rather nervous. And I think you've traversed the reasons uh, 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 why. Um, as we've seen some, from submissions, not many people are talking around this table about what the public submitted back to us and how they feel. But if we, if we look at that information well broken down for us by our excellent staff, rates being used to subsidise rents for DCC's community housing had the support of the majority of submitters. And in terms of us building more units, it had an overwhelming support at 82%. And yep, it was a wee bit closer in terms of us spending uh, one or two million each year to build more housing units. Um, as we all know, housing pressure in New Zealand is well reported and well known. And Dunedin is certainly not immune uh, to these issues. However, I think we should be extremely proud of the fact that uh, Otopoti Dunedin is the second largest uh, provider of community housing in New Zealand after, after Wellington, and I think we should pat ourselves on the back for that. Um, this is our chance, obviously, to continue front-footing what is likely to be an ongoing housing problem, um, or at least make an effort um, to, to I'll get onto the analogy uh, bandwagon of uh, making an effort, I guess, to, to push the ambulance further up the cliff, beyond halfway, and instead of leaving it at the bottom, uh, like many <coughs> other territorial authorities and, and the rest of uh, many cities in the world seem to do. Um, I fully support us and our community making sure that those who are most vul vulnerable in our community are supported to the best extent we can related to community housing. It's about the well-being of all of us having any of our residents unable to access a home or paying unaffordable rents, or as many do, living in a substandard cold accommodation, benefits neither those who are in that position or indeed the rest of us who are not. Um, I support using rates to subsidize DCC's community housing. I'm a little bit nervous uh, about what I imagine will be substantial capacity issues. Um, in building new units, but I don't see that as of enough of, of an impediment to not supporting uh, 20 million. Um, and finally, I just want to thank um, the, all the staff for their work on this and being particularly tolerant of some of us around this table who asked questions um, that was well explained in, in the papers. So I'd urge all of us to, to read our papers and absorb that information and not re-ask questions that are, that are in the meat of the papers. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Stones. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I can support A, C and D, but uh, would like to indicate that I would be moving a subsequential motion to B. Uh, that motion would look at, say, being 10% um, 
of the cost of the housing to be the subsidy so that um, we don't have to go through a sudden increase in rental, but by setting that, that threshold, from then on, the increases would be in line with our general policy of, of increases across other uh, charges that Council makes. So that would avoid the impact of a sudden rent increase, but it would cap effectively, in a, in a moving way, cap the subsidy that ratepayers apply for public good. Just thinking about that as a subsequential motion as opposed to an amendment, um, for, for, for should, the, should, should B fail, support, so then council decided that they don't support rates revenue. Uh, and so your subsequential motion would then be asking that we do support rates revenue being used to subsidise it. So I, I, would, um, I would suggest giving some thought to moving it as an amendment to the existing motion, because it's not contra to it, it's just further defining B. I'll get the wording for that and, and we'll get it up in a That's moment. Fine. This is me and my standing orders advice procedure hat as opposed to two executive hat. Just <laughs> comes up with wearing more than one. Um, if what Councillor Staines is pro proposing would see um, a change to the revenue and financing policy, which is a document that we will come to toward the end of the meeting, Gavin, potentially. Now, my understanding is we'll cover that on the 30th of June, so obviously oh. it, would, it would be a request from Council to okay. amend the finance and policy for approval in okay. June. So if B were to pass, then the mechanism for doing that would be to change the revenue and financing policy to have a to reflect whatever ratio of public-private benefit um, the councillors would um, like. And at the minute, the, the rate is about 10% rates, 90% um, rent as it currently stands. So that would be the resolution that would be required. If, if B is passed, it would be a, an addition to this potentially. I'm comfortable with that, so we'll move it to that when we're doing that review. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Reddick. Yes. Um, uh, I can support uh, three of the four resolutions here. Uh, obviously the first, A and, and the last, D. And uh, similarly with C, A, uh, we have a very present problem in the country with housing. And to me, I, there's not much difference in terms of our overall budgets and the size of uh, you know, the business we run here, whether it's 10 or 20 million over the whole time, one or two million per year. But uh, I think we should make a decent effort to build some public housing uh, in addition to what we've already got. And given that that has uh, been in abeyance for some time, I support going for the larger quantum of uh, spending. But simultaneous with that, I would ask, I, I'm not in favour of increasing council debt, which is already um, um, destined to get to very high proportions. Uh, you know, we're looking at a tripling of the debt. So I'd ask, what are we going to take out of other aspects of the 10-year plan in order to balance up 20 million for social, for community housing? So I've just avoided that use of social housing because I think with subsidising um, the rents of that housing by using rates, rates revenue takes us out of the area of public housing provider into social housing, as the mayor indicated earlier. Because since its inception in the 1940s, so for 80 years, DCC community housing portfolio was intended to operate on a break-even basis, which is a simple, sustainable basis. And I think we should be continuing with that very simple, sustainable basis and just keep those rents at a break-even figure, which are then 
allows us to be good landlords, not only to be uh, good community housing providers, but also to be good landlords and keep up with our renewals and maintenance of that housing. So all of the maintenance as we get along, but the renewals such as we're doing now at Palmyra. And we cannot do that if we are not setting break-even rents. Currently, our break-even rents are half, half that of the market rent. So it's a very low rent we're providing. And to increase it uh, by $15 a week uh, is a significant increase. It's a 10% increase, but that's exactly the same increase as we are looking to impose on the ratepayers for their increase in rates. So it is a totally realistic number to increase the rents by. And not only that, it still leaves it in the realm of half of market rents. So I urge councillors to vote for a sustainable policy that is nice and simple and keeps us going into the future. And the issue of um, who is eligible for our wait list, which currently sits at two years, will be the subject of a report, which we can then look at later. But to introduce additional complications in subsidising our rents that we set with rates puts us into an unsustainable, as I say, an unsustainable path, unsustainable trajectory, and where will that end? Will we get down to providing free housing? What is the criteria for setting those rents? It is just some notion that uh, councillors dream up at the time. Whereas keeping it in terms of the break-even provision of that housing keeps it tied to what the, act, the housing actually costs. And so we are a housing provider at cost. And keeping it simple uh, is far more likely to su succeed in the long term. Thank you. Councillor Elder. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to um, foreshadow a subsequent motion to this. It's not against any of these, it's just to add it on. Do I do that now? Yeah. Um, so I need to send that through to Lauren. You're not foreshadowing it unless you tell us what it is. Ah, okay. I've just now I've sent it. I've got it. Um, sent. Um, and the subsequent motion was that we, um, may I should kill it? Um, just because I sent it, it went away. Would so you like me to come back to you, Councillor? That, that, that the Dunedin City Council continue to explore working in partnership with other providers. And that's um, actually noted in here, neither preclude. Um, you're, not not, speaking to it, you're not speaking to it now. You, yeah. You've foreshadowed it, that's fine. Do, do yeah. you want to speak to this substantive motion? Yes, yes, I do. Okay, okay. okay. Um, so um, I can certainly support A. Um, in the feedback received, there was a wide range of responses to that. And um, one of the um, concerns that I had when listening to people, especially in the disability community, was that they didn't um, really want to, it to be precluding them, especially when we're looking at um, doing accessible housing. Um, and so it would be really nice to actually um, review that and um, get some feedback on September 2021. Um, B, I, I don't necessarily support because I believe there are sustainable options available. I do recognise that we might need to do that in the current year, but I believe we need to look at um, other options for making it more sustainable. Um, C, I think 20 million because in fact we are in a housing crisis and in fact there does need to be a huge and and uh, um, huge input into creating more houses. Um, and so I can really support that. Um, and notes decisions used to inform development of a draft, that's just part of the um, motion after this. But 
I, I, I'm really happy with that, and I just want to foreshadow that subsequential no motion, which says that the Dunedin City Council continue to explore working in partnership with other providers, because I believe that... Yeah, that's fine. You can speak to that in due yeah. course. Okay. Councillor Lofiso. Tēnākoi, Your Worship. Uh, I'd just like to record my thanks um, to the staff for their patience and um, their hard, hard work on preparing uh, this report. And I also would like to um, thank Councillor Walker for reminding us of um, what exactly we're supposed to be paying attention to. I would just like to quote from the, uh, the challenges outlined in the social wellbeing strategy. Most Dunedin residents rate their quality of life highly. However, there are some social wellbeing challenges currently facing our city. The key challenges, ageing population, low income levels, housing stock is cold and poor quality. And I'd just like to say that uh, the social wellbeing strategy goes on in terms of um, manakitanga, care of our people, all of our people, um, as an implementation, and I see this very much part of that. And I'm not interested in us breaking up and picking and choosing. How many of us around this table have actually been on the dole or the DPB long term? It's like, there but for the grace of God go I. So stop picking and choosing about what, you've, what you think is sustainable, because you haven't had the challenges, most of you that I know that people, poor Pākehā people, Māori and Pasifika in particular, have had to live through, and our decisions affect them. There's been a lot of talk in past meetings about virtue signalling and talking of people who will be required to pay because they've worked all their lives and bought their own homes. So what? There's lots of people who can't afford to get into the mortgage market. So please do not be picking and choosing. This suite helps us take care of the people. That's our job. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to my colleague, Councillor Lafesso, for her passion and the anger that I heard in her voice and I feel that too, and I'm particularly aware of a, a group that she didn't include, which was women. I'm very aware of a lot of women in the, their later years finding themselves in situations they did not expect to be in. And I want to address B first, because uh, I find it really offensive uh, that my colleague mentioned to quote some notion that councillors dream up at the time, Councillor Raddick. Um, all of these decisions have been thought out and considered carefully and reflected on in the past. And I think what we have here is a philosophical difference, a different lens through which we are looking at this. Um, some of you are thinking of it as landlords and uh, people who've bought and sold houses uh, with a development perspective, perhaps. Uh, but very much as Councillor Lafiso has outlined, we need to think about those in our community uh, who are most vulnerable, um, and we need to be thinking about caring for all of our people. And in some of the debate, I heard uh, an argument that sounded very like the, the healthcare argument I hear in the United States around, you know, everyone should look after themselves and have their own private health insurance, and, and why should we have to take care of other people. We all pay taxes, and those taxes, some of them, go to looking after the most vulnerable in our society. So this is what it's about. And for many of those people, $15 would be an extraordinary amount of money to come up with every week, even $5. So I have the feeling that a lot of people around, some of the folk around this table, are totally out of touch with their need. So I will be supporting B most definitely. In terms of A, um, I thank uh, His Worship for um, putting this forward because uh, I think this talks about us listening to uh, the people who submitted around the need and particularly in relation to families uh, and, and particularly in relation to those with disabilities. 
um, and uh, for many of those with disabilities, finding housing that uh, allows them to live in a reasonable manner um, is very, very difficult. Uh, and so moving on to C, um, ye yes, I hear what people are saying around the capacity to do this work, but and we will no doubt have our challenges in terms of supply, in terms of cost, but let's get started. And we heard from our community uh, that they support this. Um, it addresses in a small way uh, some of our housing issues um, and uh, I, I believe we'll, we'll make a bit of a start, a bit of a dent into that. It's not going to be the whole answer for sure. I look forward to the development of the, um, the housing policy and strategy, um, and I want to add my thanks to the staff for the work they've done to thus far to get us to this point. Thank you. Councillor Melly. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, these, three, these four points up here, C kind of speaks to A, because in many respects our investment rate determines whether or not we can, how many people we can put into the system. I want to go back to um, Councillor Radish did point out that this that we really got into this game around about the end of World War Two, and it was the service at that point, return servicemen from World War One, who a lot of them had suffered substantial injuries during that war, and had, were getting near, they were getting old, and they were on fixed incomes, and we have tended to morph that into that's the population that we are that we are servicing, generally speaking, people who are elderly or who are on fixed incomes that really cannot afford to do anything else and have lived good lives their whole life and have done and contributed to their community and we as a community that cares for each other is acknowledging that. And I think the reason that we are now looking and we're considering the OV65 group was that we, have, we cannot supply the need, we cannot supply the demand. So we were looking at maybe those who are in the most fixed environment are the ones we have to consider first. Um, we have a thousand units roughly and we, there's about 50 to 60,000 households in the city. So that means we only occupy about 2% of the housing stock. Um, Councillor Vanderbus is worried that somehow we're going to influence the whole rental market. I think we would need to go to more like 5,000 units and be 10% of the housing stock before that would be a significant factor. But I do want to get and address this whole question. Um, I think old decisions about being cost neutral have come back because of a reticence to be having any influence at all in private investors' ability to get return on rent. And we've been worried about crossing some line. Now whether you believe it's speculation or supply, there's no doubt that the housing market, cost of housing has exploded. The entry level for people has gone away for many trying to enter for the first time. And I think it's fair to say that some people are buying houses and using rental income to pay for that mortgage and therefore the rental market is contributing to the speculation market. The commentary that we should be linking our rent to the current rental rates means that we then link ourselves to all of that. I believe, and we said on some of our tables, um, I think ta uh, table two, um, we should be linking our rent to the affordability of the, of the tenant because ultimately we are building these for the tenants. We are not building them as a rate return. We're not building them as, a, as an investment. We're building them as a social good, and that goes to B. Supports rates revenue being used. We may decide to set that number at zero later, but the point is, it's unlikely, but the point is if we don't take a stance to say that in fact under our rates system that there is both a, community, a, private, a public and a private good, we will never be able to ever change away from the fact that we're treating it as a private good. So B allows us to come and actually ask that very specific philosophical question. Um, I'm, I would therefore be reluctant to put any numbers on what we're going to do with that at this point until we get a feedback on where that's going to go. Um, the, I just want to finish on multi-storey versus single storey. I've seen plenty of multi-storey buildings in the United States where I lived for many years dealing with people who have massive disability issues and especially around ageing. It's really, if we're going, all of our, all of our strategies should be interlinked and, and, and looking at each other. So therefore we should be considering our spatial plan, everything we're planning on in the future. So I think as we go forward we should also be considering these builds would be, could be multi-storey and it could be in the middle of town. The $20 million, it doesn't have with it a number of units that's going to come, it is a budget item. 
we were discussing the number of units as a way to get ahead around where we could have an impact on it. But yes, obviously the longer we take to spend, the more the number, the cost of the units will go up and therefore the number of units you spend, you get will change. But what we're really saying is no less than 20 million, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments. The first of them following on from the comment um, Councillor O'Malley just made about B. This isn't a debate about um, the level. This is this part of the discussion is about princi principles. And for a long time, it's been a principle of this authority that we have a role in providing community housing. I'm actually very proud when I look at, oh, first of all, thank you to, Ms. to, to the staff for the map and the appendices in particular. That map of community housing holdings by local authorities is one of the most telling statements I've seen in a long time about the councils fulfilling their social responsibility. And this council has consistently resisted attempts to hock off assets, including the public housing asset. Our community housing, though, is just part of the wider picture. We know about our Mayor's Task Force historically and ongoing for housing. We know about the issues and the work we've done around cosy homes to improve the quality of housing in the city. We know that we are, have worked and are continuing to work with other agencies, such as Kanga Aura, but not exclusively. We uh, came to an agreement the other day about a building and supporting a development um, on the waterfront that is being run jointly with the Salvation Army. So this is part of the picture. And while we should be justly proud of the fact we have the second largest holding of community, local government owned community housing in the country, the job's far from done. And I support all of these, um, all of these motions. I look forward to the debate about the level of uh, cross-subsidy or public good. And I think that was a telling comment, the question that related to that earlier. Let's make no bones about it, the public, uh, sorry, our community housing hasn't run at a loss by accident. It's run as it has been run because of the annual fee setting decisions of this body. And the red bits in the report are when this body, our predecessors and some of us here, said no, we are not going to put up the rents. So forget sustainability, it's an objective decision to get that, that has led to that outcome. So I look forward to that wider debate. I've got absolutely no doubt that B will uh, pass substantially uh, and I thank the Mayor for putting these four together in this form. Further speakers? Councillor Lord. Yeah, I'd just um, like to say that I don't support B, and I simply I, I do it for this reason. And I've heard the impassioned plea from Councillor Lafiso, but I think there's a lot of people around who are struggling to contain and own their own properties, and every bit of rates difference makes a difference to those people too. So, th and I'm not talking about me or or anyone around this table. We're all well paid. That's not a problem. But I'm thinking about people that have lived a whole life and have just got to the end of their working lives, just got a house. It's now, rates have gone up, everything goes up, and they're living on the pension and they don't have a lot of money. And I think there's an awful lot of people that live all through places like where Councillor Lafiso has referred to, people that live in Brockville, people that live in Corstaphine, people that live in South Dee and St Kilda. And a lot of those people, if we start um, using the general rate to support these other people, the question is, well, why did they bother? And I think that's a question some people can right, right, rightfully ask. Um, I, I do have a trouble with uh, C as well. I, I would have been happy to support the one million a year for 10 years. Um, not so sure that I f support 20 million, but I think there again, I understand that these people have had a variety of challenges. I do take on the, the Mayor's point when he moved the motion about this is community housing and we shouldn't be trying to sort out whether or not um, this is the same as Moana Pool subsidy. I, I, I totally get that there is a good benefit in having people in housing, but I think in view of the fact that, as we've been told, that general rates, in the, uh, general rates of rent for one-bedroom units are in the $300 range, I wouldn't think it was entirely 
um, ridiculous to put the rates up a bit. And I think the other thing that we could do is make sure that we're running every section of that department efficiently because it still seems to me that uh, it, it should be able to run and put some money aside. Um, thank you. Um, I will be supporting A and D, but I'm struggling with B and C. Um, the first thing is I welcome discussion around um, our housing model and where it goes to. Um, I think the, the key thing is we've got to focus on better outcomes for our tenants and ratepayers. And I think when we look at this right across the board, especially in DC and uh, D, DCC community housing policy and strategy, um, I think that is really going to be a catalyst for us and an important part. I want to thank all those who, who submitted on this issue, and it's, you know, and 82% of support of rates being used, I think, is a, is a very uh, strong number and shows where the community heart is at, and I am in that same position. What I'm really struggling on is the fact there's not enough emphasis on build, you know, there's so much emphasis on building new housing units where I believe we're actually not investing enough in the current units we have to bring them up to spec. And if some of those are demolished and, re and basically more units are built, then I'm supportive of that. I was actually going to support a $10 million increase. And I also noted that there was a deficit of $660,000. And when I looked at that number, I was thinking, well, okay, that's going to be, you know, quite a bit in that sense. That's we're going to be looking at. And that goes on to our debt and it goes on to our rates. So if we look at this right across the board, that's $2.7 million if we look at going through with B and C as outlined. $2.7 million over 10 years, $27 million. You know, essentially we asked about $20 million. We asked about $10 million. And then, again, I stick at $10 million. If we had have capped it at $20 million, including the deficit, I would have been supportive on that basis. But I find this could be a case of where we go into just keep expanding. And I think that we really need to go back to the DCC Community Housing Policy and Strategy. We need to go back to what is going to be important and how this is going to be governed. The key thing that I get the feeling of around the table is we all know more can be done, and, but what is the model to get that done? And what is that level of investment? Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Usha. Um, I support A and D. I also support C. I think that council is in the position to do something about the housing crisis. Many councillors over many meetings have talked about the, the housing crisis, and now is the time to actually do something and commit ourselves to it. Um, we all live in this city together, and we do need to look after our most vulnerable, which has um, been brought up a number of times. I was on the fence about B. Our policy had been to um, have a break even. However, listening to the debate in, in the amount of public good, I do agree that we should subsidise the rates revenue. Um, Chris has, Councillor Staines has brought up a number. However, I feel that we're not in the position to debate a number today, and I would look forward to the, um, the review from A to inform that decision. I think that's everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, bearing in mind we've had at least two <laughs> subsequential or consequential motions that have been foreshadowed here. Um, thank you. I just want to thank uh, councillors for the debate because it's been um, an interesting one, and as you would anticipate, uh, among a body uh, elected by a community that have different views, we have different views sitting around the table and, and different values and different perspectives. And I think uh, the point Councillor uh, Gary made is a, is a good one. That we, we seem to be, um, there are two different perspectives you can take when it comes to the debates that we're having around uh, our community housing portfolio. One is the view of 
uh, the landlord and, and how much we can get away with charging, basically. Uh, and, and the other is the view of the tenant, which is how much they can afford to pay. And I'll point out on, on, on table two that has been referenced, you know, the, the, the markers of what is affordable in terms of uh, accommodation costs as a percentage of your income usually sit closer to 30 per cent. There are other measures that go as high as 50. We're already in the, in the upper half of that, and any increase, whether it's $5 or $15, would, uh, would take that even further. And I think that has to be our focus. If the purpose of the community housing portfolio is providing accommodation uh, for people on low and fixed incomes to be able to have somewhere to live with a degree of dignity, then our focus has to be on what it is that is affordable for them to pay. And the difference between that and what it costs to run that uh, portfolio uh, is, the, is, a, is a public good in that we are able to provide that for not enough people, um, but more people uh, if, we, if we support the, the plans here. And, and again, you know, we've, uh, the 250,000 per unit cost has been focused on, and, and I don't know if that's particularly helpful because depending on what kind of unit you build and, or where you build it or when in the next 10 years, it seems highly likely that those uh, costs will vary, but we're not being asked to commit to a cost per unit build. We're being asked to provide a, an envelope of funding over a 10-year period to contribute to the, the, the commitments that we've already made and, and to, to support the social wellbeing outcomes of our community through providing affordable rental accommodation uh, to people on low and fixed incomes. And to, in response to Councillor Hall's question, absolutely. I mean, it will be uh, the, the capital budgets within that 10-year period can be moved around should some uh, opportunity arise. So I don't, I don't think we need to be too concerned about um, coming up with $2 million worth of work every year over the 10-year over the period and, and certainly would welcome uh, any opportunities uh, that did arise uh, to be brought back to this table for us to be able to debate um, how we manage the, the capital budgets to take advantage, uh, to take advantage uh, of those. Um, I, I agree with the comments of Councillor O'Malley. I find it extraordinary to, that we would suggest that what we are doing is creating any kind of downward pressure on the uh, private rental market. There doesn't appear to be any downward pressure uh, on the private rental market, and that's with our portfolio as it currently exists, and adding another, let's say, 80 units over the 10 years uh, would seem to be insignificant to me uh, in, turning that, uh, in turning that around. But uh, again, thanks, uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, for the discussion. I will uh, take them all by, well, I'll take B and C by division, um, and, and A and D if people would like that. But no, I'm happy to, I'll take uh, A. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. B, I'll take by division. Thank you. Agreed. Part C. Is that being taken by division? Okay. Right. <laughs> the council decides that $20 million will be included in the 10 year plan to build more community housing, being $2 million per annum over the 10 year period. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Poe? Aye. Councillor Alder? Yes. Councillor Garrett? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? You have some time. No. Councillor Fieser? Aye. 
Councilor Lord? No. Councilor Thank you. Part D, I'll, I'll, I'll take. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, that's agreed. It might be pertinent now to adjourn for five minutes to allow those who are working through their consequential or subsequential motions to take advice on those. I'll move that we adjourn. Seconded. Councillor Walker, all those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
Procedure oh, that's probably helpful from you, Ms. Graham, while people familiarise themselves with that. So, so councillors, given that you passed that rates would um, subsidise at some level the um, rental for community housing, the revenue and financing policy does need to be amended um, to show something in order that um, Gavin can um, build the budgets. And so uh, you'll also notice that in um, your fees and charges paper, um, there's a suggestion in that that rents don't actually increase until August 2022, if at all. And so this, in the meantime, is just something that enables Gavin to meet our audit requirements and have documents that align with the decisions of council. This can, the um, revenue and financing policy can be reconsidered again as part of the annual plan in December, January. So this is just something that needs to be done to let the budgets be built now by the end of June. But this, this, as proposed, would allow for what is being proposed in, in practice. So this functionally, 10% um, is covers the subsidy that had been being applied to um, our community housing. And, and further, the the constraint around rising, lifting the rents in the coming financial year is equally as much about the changes to the Residential Tenancies Act. Which we can now only lift once every yes. months. So August twenty two yes. August twenty two is the earliest we are able to offer oh, January. January. But Come August twenty twenty two lines up with a range of other things. Yeah. You're moving this, I'm happy to second that councillor. To speak to it. So in moving this, um, we get the outcome that we are looking for for the next financial year and that is that rentling, rents will not increase. Um, it provides an opportunity then for council to look at what ratio of public good council wishes to have in any year following that as part of long-term plan or annual plan. So I, I think this gives a known amount for the next financial year, which as Sandy has explained the requirement for that, um, and gives us an opportunity as council to review that um, in our future plans. Yeah, thank you. And, and in supporting this, it's, I, I'm, I don't support this because I think this is the right split. I support it because this allows us to, um, this facilitates the decisions that we've already made uh, and, and allows us subsequently to, to debate how this might fall in the longer term, but I don't know if there's any uh, merit at, at this point in, in us individually picking numbers out of the year beyond the one that just accommodates the decisions that we've already made. Um, so that's why I'm comfortable enough with this. Councillor O'Malley? I just want to repeat that very same statement, which is I would be uncomfortable normally at setting these numbers like this. I've heard the CEO's commentary on basically the requirement for the balanced budget. <coughs> I'd be very surprised the number was exactly 10%. Um, and I would hope that in the next annual plan it's reviewed so we get a clearer understanding of what that number is. Councillor Hulhan. Thank you. Can I just clarify, does this mean if <clears throat> there is an imbalance and the rents don't fully cover things and it goes over, the intention is it won't go over more than 10% and then if it, do, if it starts to rents will have to be adjusted, is that what the... Or the ratio, will, or, we right. could adjust the I ratio. Think, yes, yes, okay, thank you. Speakers, councillor, well you can raise questions and speaking to it and questions can be answered in reply. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yeah, I'm just concerned on the definition of rates revenue and other revenue, so is this speaking to the, um, the break-even cost of community housing. Well, well this, this is... Uh, and then this other revenue this reflects, being defined as rent. This yeah. reflects the language in the revenue and financing policy for all activities. Right. So, so, okay, so other revenue is just a broad... Could be anything. This simply reflects the... 
if you you will have the um, policy in front of you, and if you turn to the relevant page, which Carolyn might have, I don't know, um, you can see that this has been written so that it replaces the, the wording that's in the current revenue and financing policy, and they are the headings that are used there. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Walker. Yep, <clears throat> I'll be very brief. I'm very comfortable to support this as it insulates uh, against uh, rate rises in the next financial year, and as the mover um, has stated, it gives us the chance to further debate uh, how this looks in the longer term. And I will repeat once again, rates being used to subsidise rents for DCC's community housing had the support of a vast majority of submitters. Your right of reply, Councillor. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? We'll take it by division. Thank you. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? No. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? No. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandevis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? Uh, aye. The motion is carried 10 to 5. Thank you. And I'll take, I mean, I'm taking these in the order that they are presented. I, I do have one to follow on from this, but we'll come back to it as foreshadowing that, uh, asking for a report in time for the annual plan, looking at the, the ratio specifically. But, Councillor Elder. Sorry. Sorry about that. Lauren, Lauren will put up my... Um, notes that this Deneen. What's that? <laughs> um, but I have five minutes to speak to this. It's a ceiling, not a target. But is it, do you have a seconder for your motion? Seconded by everyone. Seconded, Councillor Wiley. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just see that, in fact, um, being able to work in partnership with other housing providers means, in fact, that we could actually leverage of our partnerships and produce more housing, plus we can create a strategy amongst other housing providers to provide more. And one of the um, models um, I had talked about and, uh, um, was um, a model that um, has been used in Dunedin already. There's Abbey Field who approached us, who's a community housing provider who we could partnership with. But also there's a, a model in Auckland which means that Auckland City Council actually keeps the land and their houses, but a management group looks after the housing, and this enables them to get their income-related rents. And I look at their um, snapshot, and the return they can get is a 3.1 surplus. Now, the partnership arrangement means they put, they are committed to putting all that money back into social housing. So what effectively happens is they manage and upgrade the houses, they support the residents so they get far better support because they're a community housing provider, not a social housing provider. But in return for that, they get <coughs> income-related rents. And this has meant that they have been able to reinvest considerable amounts of money into providing more housing. And in fact, Wisha Village opened um, just recently in, in Henderson, which is brand new housing. Um, so what I'm really putting out here is we need to be open to looking in, and working in partnership with other um, housing providers looking at, at, at different arrangements so that in fact we are in a housing crisis that we can use our investment to actually create more houses, not less. So that's why I'm supporting it. 
or put it forward. And I just want us to explore the options. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley. Yeah, I'm happy to support the second this motion. Um, and I think it really covers off that there's a lot of ways that we actually can do a lot of positive work in the housing space. And we don't have to be the driving force behind it. We don't have to own it. We, we can partner. And I think there's a lot of possibilities that will come out of that, a lot of benefits for our residents, for our tenants, and for our ratepayers. And I think that's the important part that I look at here. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I'll be definitely supporting this. It makes common sense. It saves our ratepayers money if we don't have to put as much in, and it could mean we get more housing. So it's a sensible idea, and I thank um, Councillor Alder for putting this motion forward. I think it's a good one. Um, I also think we need to perhaps go further and look at what's been discussed at other meetings as maybe a, an option of a trust if the government turns down our um, suggestion of market rent subsidies because under a trust I believe we could um, let our tenants would be able to get uh, market rent subsidies. It means we'd get more money coming in, they'd get subsidised for it. It's a win-win situation because our ratepayers um, will get the benefit of that. And I noticed there was a comment made earlier from um, Your Worship uh, that said in a bit of a scathing way that we could be landlords as if it's a terrible thing. Um, but what I have to remind, um, what I want to remind Your Worship of, is that the fact that we're landlords in this position with the you know more than 900 properties is that we've taken on a responsible role as governors of this money, of our ratepayers. So we are landlords for the ratepayers' benefit, who all want to see us governing in a prudent, sensible financial way. And to question when we're going to add 20 million to our budget is a sensible thing to do when we're spending other people's money. It's not our money, it's the ratepayers' money. Councillor, that, de that debate has happened. Uh, I'd yes, ask but I'm I'd, just I'd bringing it up because we're still talking about housing. No, we're, asking, we're talking about this motion that is on the, that's on the table it's before It's relevant. Us. And there was another comment made before as well about why are councillors bringing up questions that are in the papers? Councillor. Uh, uh, and this, and this, I want to raise this. It's a very good reason for it, and I do it regularly order, because people order, watch these Gary. videos and point they, need, they order, don't have, and I will have hear, read the I papers. I will hear the point of order, Councillor Gary. Uh, arguing with the Mayor when you've made a decision about something is, is inappropriate and against our standing orders. I'm, I'm happy with people to argue with me. I, I won't uphold the point of order, but I would um, suggest that the commentary relitigating debates that we've had only minutes ago uh, in this forum isn't, isn't relevant to the, the nature of the motion that is before us. So I would ask Council if you would focus your remarks on what we are being asked to debate. Okay, well I'll just end by saying I think it's beneficial for us to highlight good points and ask questions around those from reports for people who are watching and of course for reporters who are here reporting. We need to be open and transparent. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just the one point I wanted to make was that I'm happy to support uh, this motion and I focus on the word continue. I would uh, hate people to think that we're not already doing this work. As everyone around this table knows from things that have been brought before us, this work has already been done. But I thank uh, my colleague, Councillor Alder, for, for bringing this and uh, putting in the word continue because it continues to be an important thing, uh, uh, activity for us to explore. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Wisha. I can support this. As, um, in the ODT 2018, it talks about the Mayor's Task Force for Housing and says the Task Force for Housing has brought together representatives from council, community housing providers, social service agencies, government departments, public health specialists, commercial properties, managers and runaka. So we're already doing this. So can supporting the continuation is a no-brainer. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. 
Your Worship, I think I'm just supporting Councillor Elder here because I believe that really what she's trying to push forward here is to make sure we don't lose focus on the fact that these other partnerships can contribute to the whole and part of our holistic um, development of strategy requires that we keep reminding ourselves that we have those partners. <laughs> Councillor Lofiso. Uh, Tenako, Your Worship, um, I'd like to thank the mover and I would just like to point out that it's not, a, it's not just a case of adding more housing to the market or the stock, whatever, but also to take note that it's um, uh, important to acknowledge the fact that we have 3,906 houses unoccupied, 7.4% as, uh, as per the 2018 census. So it's not, it's not that we're short of the physical houses, there are 3,906 houses that are not occupied. Thank you. Further speakers? I, I can support this as it's written. What makes me nervous is the comments that have been made by the, the mover and others uh, around um, this work as described encompassing a, a relitigation of the debate as to whether or not we are the direct owners of our uh, community housing stock versus it being handed off to an arm's length trust or uh, sold to other community housing providers. I, I strongly believe that direct ownership of the asset is the only way that our community, as representatives of our community, that we can stay in direct control uh, over, over that. Um, um, it's, it's not explicit in the, in the wording of, uh, of this, um, so I'm, I'm comfortable enough to support it, uh, but that is certainly um, you know, divesting ourselves of the asset that we currently have certainly isn't my interpretation of continuing to explore working in partnership with other housing providers. But I certainly can support the work that, as has been pointed out, that we are doing uh, with various parties and will continue to do with various parties in, in the interests of our, uh, our ambitions to deliver on uh, the Housing Action Plan. Councillor Elder, your right of reply. Um, I would like to thank the support around the table for this. I wanted to make it overt in our, um, in our actions because, in fact, it is easy to lose things. And I think when we review our housing portfolio and strategy, I believe this is a huge part of how we are going to achieve our housing goals. Um, at, referring to um, the Mayor's comment about um, selling our assets, I would never consider selling our land or housing assets. I believe, though, that there are opportunities for partnerships going forward that would enable our money to actually go further. Um, and those kind of things need to be explored because we need to look for a long-term sustainable options and solutions that are good for our whole community and are cost effective. And I believe um, continuing this work will actually enable that to happen. So, and that's why I put the motion. And I, 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 we desperately need more houses and we desperately need to work in partnership so that more money is put into creating more houses for the people of Dunedin. That's, uh, that's agreed. Uh, and finally, he says presumptuously, um, I've drafted this is something that's been sent through, uh, just picking up on the, or well, following on from the discussion around the rates, revenue and financing policy uh, that will allow us to uh, subsequently have the discussion around how, where we want to see that, um, see that land and um, I, can, I can keep padding for time, that's fine. <laughs> uh, and it would just be useful in terms of, the, of Council's work program for this to be resolved at this meeting to make sure that the work gets done in, uh, uh, in, in time for our, um, our budget meetings in December or January or wherever they may fall in the next financial year. Yeah, the council requests a review of the policy as it applies to community housing in, in time for the next annual plan. Is there a second to, second to Councillor Staines? Thank you. Um, I've already spoken to it, so I won't. Further speakers? I'll put it. All those in favour? 
Those against, that's agreed. And that is item eight. Item nine, public toilets. An easy one before lunch. Mr. Bainbridge is afar, Mr. West, welcome back. Thank you, gentlemen, and, and a note that table two in our papers sets out a proposed delivery plan for the money that's been included in the draft budget. Um, and I'm, I'm seeking some general comment, I suppose, uh, around were council of a mind to shift things, remove how, how separable are the individual items in this uh, work program versus how um, yeah, versus it being a single body of work. Does that make sense? Just before people start asking those questions. Um, I would say they're entirely separable. And that the work is, because it's still in the draft budget, hasn't yet been allocated to any deliverer. I guess I, I, but some of these things are timed for reasons other than general phasing? Are they, are they timed to fit in with other pieces of work whether years are specific or not? Some of them are, yeah. So which, <laughs> which so, ones? So year one, Your Worship, obviously uh, Council have asked for the, the changing places bathroom to be f factored into year one, so that would presumably not be something you'd want, the Council would want to change. Um, I think that the bulk of the rest have been based on the um, submissions and the, the feedback we've received. So I think there is a, a fair level of um, ability to move them around still. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, that was rude of me. Anything you wish to add at this point? Councillor Raddick. Yes, um, thank you for the report. It's very good. And of course, there were a huge number of submissions uh, about this issue. Uh, I'm curious, well, I think the, the matrix you've used and the criteria are really good. I'm curious about item number six, evidence of fouling, because that would you know, speak to evidence. Has that been a, uh, a significant criteria in your choice of areas? Um, it's just one of the factors, and, and those factors are given relative weightings. Yeah, the, the, the more fouling evidence there is, then the higher up the, the matrix the score would get. Thank you. Mr. All Mr. I'd ask, Councillor, is that we, we do receive um, complaints on, on that issue um, from time to time from across the city. Yep. So it is one of the factors we look at. Yes, well, uh, just to me, it's quite a measurable factor. So I was just curious how it's, how it's informed. That <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. It's going to be quite hard getting through this debate without deferring to puns when we're on toilets. Um, yeah, the, the, my question is, uh, is around the fact that it was noted that a lot of people in the submission process requested toilets where they already exist. Has this, I guess, highlighted a helpful situation around the fact maybe the need for better signage or, or whatnot? Yeah, as part of our uh, renewal work and, and review of the toilets, we will be doing a signage review. We're also doing some work to improve our website information as well as to where toilets are. Councillor Lord. Uh, yeah, my question was more probably a question for you rather than staff, but it's is this not getting fairly operational when we're actually deciding where public toilets are to go? Is that, Why would this be our role? Oh, it's, a, it's a work programme. It's a work pro programme that's been put together by staff and presented to us in response to decisions we've made in the draft budget. Uh, the, the, I, I share your view around the merits of us getting involved in the individual items over that 10 year period, but it's here because we've asked for it basically. Councillor Elder. Related to Steve's question, is there the thought that there could be a loo app? so people can see where their loos are. And um, the other question was, um, in, in this plan, um, where, where is the South Dunedin changing places 
in the library as per the papers. Oh, I've missed it. Sorry. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, in year two, um, am I correct in reading that, that that's the exchange toilets going and there's one going in in St Leonard's? Um, so the, there are no there are no public toilets in the exchange area at the moment. There are toilets in the Dowling Street car park, and as part of the development of the ACC yes. building on that car park, those public toilets will be removed. We'll go here. Um, so we're proposing to build some toilets nearby. The exchange is very close to the Dowling Street car park, and um, we're also proposing to build toilets at St Leonard. So those are two different toilets, both to be uh, built in year two. Right. Thank you for clarifying that, because I wasn't sure the way it read whether that meant there was two or not. So that means there'll be two in that year and one in the previous year. Is that the way I read that? Correct. Yeah. The changing okay. places bathroom is a, a quite a complex build, so it, it's, a, it's quite a higher cost than a, than a standard toilet. So year one, a single toilet, the changing places one, yes. and for each subsequent year we'd, we'd hope to be able to build two toilets. Oh great. And so the one in St Leonard's, will that be by the Yacht Club? Um, so as we've said below the, uh, in the table there, yes. the exact location will be worked through, so no exact locations have been identified okay. as no, yet. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for the report. Um, and uh, the question I wanted to ask was a, a sort of high level question, and that the matrix was developed from a matrix, was it Invercargill? or Southland District Council, yeah, um, and, and, and you've developed it a little bit from that. Do you have confidence that uh, this was a useful way to work through the list of submissions and suggestions uh, to come up with the list that we have? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's been, it's been very useful in talking to our colleagues at other councils. They, they, op they operate similar matrices. Excellent. Thank you so much. Councillor Reddick. Uh, speaking to a, a point that Councillor Elder made earlier about a, a Lou app, has, I have spoken previously about uh, Google Maps updating. So have all our public toilets been updated or are they completely up to date on the Google Maps facility? I'm afraid I don't know. I'll. I'll check into that with our uh, IT team and get back to you. Yes, because of course what that is, is... Is, that, uh, is it a question, Councillor? Uh, Councillor no, thank you. Um, just in relation to a couple of um, um, areas with, uh, who appear to be on or near reserves, um, or care reserve and Trevor King reserve, you've got them indicated as being in community board areas. Will you also be talking to the reserve management committees as well? Because there can be some issues of um, tension between providing services and providing good outcomes for that area. And then the other one is the need and destination plan. Are you looking at that as well when you're looking at these? Yeah, absolutely. As we've indicated below the table there, we'll work with relevant stakeholders, and that includes the uh, economic development guys in terms of the destination plan and the, the reserve management as well. Yeah, I, I just had a similar question. So this, I'm comfortable with it uh, um, as a list, so long as that work is done subsequently, and particularly in terms of managing uh, the cultural values of these particular sites and the peninsula in particular is reasonably sensitive, but also the vexed issue of induced demand in providing infrastructure like this in areas that are particularly ecologically sensitive and just seeking reassurance that those kinds of concerns will be worked through as we get closer to the time of delivering each of these things. Yeah, they, absolutely, they will be considered, yeah, great. I'd just add to that, Your Worship, that um, the team, the staff will work and continue to work fairly closely with the likes of DOC as well on some of this work, so. Thank you. Councillor Elder. I am happy to move the motion. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking here for some, for a, a, to see if there is a toilet in the Silverstream recreational area that's there. I don't see anything, but am I missing that? Is there, plan, is there plans for that? Because it's quite run down that area and a lot of people use it. And I know the Mosque Community Board has submitted on that quite a few times. 
Are you referring to the um, toilet at Outram Glen in particular? Yes. It's mentioned in there that that work is be, being done. Um, to upgrade the existing what, facility. Yeah, what year is that? Did no, it's it's independent up. of this. Oh, is it? Okay. Sorry, so it's saying that it will be, it will be upgraded. Refer you to page 70 um, on the table of the community board. It's the first one on the table. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. Is it appropriate to make an addition to this? Well, are there further questions, first of all? No. So this uh, has been moved by Councillor Elder, seconded by Councillor Walker. Councillor Elder can speak to it, and as per any debate, amendments and can be moved, or subsequential or consequential motions can be foreshadowed in the course of debate. Councillor Elder. For one, I've always wanted to um, state that in relation to this um, motion is to move the motion. But um, on, I, I want to actually recommend the Parks and Recreation P Department for their vision around this. I believe that for a number of years we have had a lack of amenity in our many recreational um, areas. I think of Navy Park, for example, where parents have to take their children home because they can't stay playing. And I think the play value and the stay value in this is really, really important. To get good quality play, you need to have facilities that enable those families to play longer. Um, and I look at the um, the toilet going along St Leonard's, and once that cycleway is finished, that cycleway will be very, very popular. And so I believe um, that too is essential. Again, not just for recreational use, but for people who are commuting. And so I think that's um, a really good addition. And I like to see people enjoying the outdoors, playgrounds and recreational areas for longer. It gives them better quality interaction with nature and the outdoors and improves their health and well-being. Uh, the other addition to this, which is really exceptional, is the changing places toilets, both in the city and in South Dunedin, will enable the disability community to be active and involved for longer in our city, in our amenities, and be able to use um, whether it's um, the library, whether it's um, shopping, or other recreational facilities for longer and stay in town. And I, I believe that this enables ac equal access and longer access for recreational and other activities. So I. I fully support this. Thank you, Council. Just looking at the um, at the wording as this is proposed, I wonder, in reflecting what is in the work program, whether changing places, bathrooms, uh, is a better oh, option yes. when there are two, and change and to including because obviously they are public toilet facilities. So yeah. work for new public toilet facilities, including the changing places, bathrooms. Yep, You're I'm happy there? to Council accept Walker? that. <laughs> just for clarity, really, it's not an amendment. It's just um, better, better reflecting what's. Thank, you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I can assure uh, Councillor Elder that the. I'm not calling. I'm not calling on you to speak. I'm just asking if you're comfortable with the second oh, of the motion to change the <laughs> to, to change the word. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Councillor uh, Councillor Raddock and then Councillor Walker. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd like to propose an amendment to this Part C, that uh, Council requests that staff review and the Google Maps listings for public toilets in Dunedin and update them where appropriate. You can write that down I uh, and I can send it through. That's all good. We'll deal with, oh, you want to deal with it as an amendment? It's, a, it's not an amendment. It's we'll not, just part C. I can do it. We'll do it subsequently. It's fine because it doesn't alter this. We'll, we'll get to that. Councillor Walker. It's obviously getting close to lunch. Um, <laughs> 
<coughs> I'll, I'll start again. I can assure Councillor Elder that um, the, you, you alluded to the, pop, the potential popularity of the cycleway to Port Chalmers. I can assure you it's already extremely, extremely mm. popular and well used. Um, I've often gone on record, I think, around this table saying that if we acceded to every um, request for a public toilet in every place, we'd literally have hundreds of thousands of public toilets around the city. It seems that everyone wants one everywhere. Um, but I do want to thank the staff for this detailed report. Um, and excuse the pun when I say I couldn't resist. Because of that, our decision will definitely have something to go on. Um, hap I'm, I'm happy, obviously, to support this. I second it uh, to fund two toilets uh, per year from 2022-23. And, of course, the changing places uh, bathroom the next uh, financial year. And I just want to thank uh, Councillor Gary for her advocacy in, in that space um, o o over, the, over, the, over the years around this issue. I'm also very glad to see the submission from the, uh, the West Harbour Community Board, uh, not only their overall submission to us actually, because it was very, very short. I think it went to about uh, 12 or 10 sentences. Good on them, but I'm glad to see that uh, the submission from the Community Board to have a a, a, site, a, a a toilet at St. Leonard's about the time the completion of the cycle away takes, the shared path takes way, uh, has, has, has rated so highly in the decision-making matrix. And I think if you, if you follow the whole path from the city around to Port Chalmers, I think it's a really sensible spot to have a toilet. Um, it's also worth noting that when the uh, Dunedin Hospital is built, that we will have three changing places, bathrooms in this city. And that is something, as a city, we should be extremely proud of. It again signals, again, the progressive thinking of the city council and its staff. Um, and also, it's, I think it's worth uh, thanking all those in the disabled community for their advocacy uh, around getting changes, places, toilets, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. I um, support this motion. It's very sensible to use the toilet matrix, and I welcome that. Glad to see the, um, the public consultation on the, the toilet siting. And my concern, as a couple of councillors in the Mayor brought up, is around the consideration around some of the areas. Um, some of them are on proposed reserves in very sensitive areas, like Orkea, and it's questionable whether building lose and encouraging visitors will lead to um, to good outcomes. So I hope these are issues are addressed through the destination planning consultation. And I note that um, paragraph 20 did say that the programme will be reviewed regularly to assess that it still meets current community needs as Dunedin develops. So that gives me some comfort around supporting this. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm thinking of my father. Uh, as I speak, because in public life uh, he used to go on quite extensively about public toilets and how they uh, determine um, how people view a city or a town. Um, and uh, so I'm delighted to see, I really welcomed uh, this work program to deliver uh, two, two per year. Um, but I want to start with the changing places um, toilet, uh, and I thank the mover and seconder. Um, I recall being very moved by the submissions that we had, and they were a, a very extensive submissions and very well articulated, which told us about the indignity of having to change an adult daughter uh, in an airport air bridge um, and, uh, and others. So uh, this is a, an outstanding um, outcome to have not one but three um, in our city before too long and I believe there are only two others in all of New Zealand if I have that correct. So uh, as Councillor Walker said we're leaders yet again and we should be really proud of that um, and we listened very carefully to our community uh, when they spoke on this. As for the other toilets, uh, thank you to the staff for using um, the toilet matrix, a more objective way of, of having a look at this because in all the time that I was on community board and all the time I've been in local government, um, people all have a view and everybody wants a toilet in all sorts of places and we can't deliver all of that. But this speaks to the issue of playgrounds to some degree. It talks about, uh, it, it helps the issue of children being able to stay in those areas, the elderly. 
Um, and it also addresses some of the issues around the cycleway and the lack of public toilets. So thank you for the for the list. Um, I I particularly welcomed item uh, paragraph 20, which talked about exact locations being worked through with relevant stakeholders, including Mana Whenua, um, and I take the point about the reserves, uh, and the programme being reviewed regularly, because the needs will change, there's no doubt about that. And so thank you to the staff for their work. I'm very happy to see this come to fruition and to support it. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, as a person who's regularly seen running faster than normal, I don't normally run, but um, to get off the track because I need to go or into a bush, I am very, very pleased that the West Harbour, particularly the St Leonard's one, is getting a toilet, and I'm delighted that um, we, as Councillor Gary has said, we have um, changing places um, toilets for disabled people particularly. I think um, I also, like Councillor Gary, heard the people um, who submitted and was could see there's a clear need for it. So I want to thank staff for, uh, for doing this. And also, I want to say it's great to see um, community boards and their locations noted here. I hope community boards will see this and feel like they've really been listened to. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yes, I fully support the, the motion and thank the staff for their great work. I think uh, the changing places, just as uh, many submitters, many uh, speakers have mentioned, is a very significant and to move from zero to three uh, will be uh, a very significant shift in our accommodation of those with, that need such a thing, especially in the locations that they're going to be. And similarly, I think the nice, uh, the good geographic spread of loos that we're putting in around the place and catering to all of the voices that have been raised and there were very many raised uh, at the submission. So I think it's a very good job. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I can support this with the caveat that more work will be done on the specifics of the um, placement. I mean, there are particularly on the peninsula significant cultural values and, and ecological values, and, and I think we do need to come to terms with the idea of, of induced demand uh, in sensitive areas better than we have historically, because uh, what we tend to do is figure out how many people are in, er in an area, and when it gets to a certain level, um, decide that they need to be catered for by a public toilet, and then you build one, and then you get more people uh, going to that area, and, and that isn't necessarily the best way of uh, managing some of our uh, special uh, places. So knowing that the the sites more specifically will be worked through with uh, with Manafena or DOC or, or other parties gives me uh, com comfort enough uh, to be able to support this. Councillor Alder, your right of reply. I think most things have been said and I, I just want to um, talk to um, Carmen's point and that is we need to look after our whole community and these public toilets are about spreading this throughout our community boards and we need to listen to our community and serve our communities well and I think in doing this we have done that and I know also that there is a review also of play spaces which I think sits alongside of this and we are actually improving public amenity across our community, and that's a really important thing to do. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Councillor Raddick. So I have a uh, subsequent motion, a part C, or whatever, that. Uh, we, re we request staff to undertake a review of our Google Maps listings for public toilets in Dunedin and make, change, make alterations as appropriate. Because yeah, happy to second. Do you, want to, do you wish to speak to it? Yes, well this will give us the app that, uh, and the universal app that everybody, that most people will have on their phones and uh, Google Maps provides a really good listing. So if you put in your phone now uh, public toilets Dunedin, unfortunately not all of them will show up. 
So the net result of this will be that all of our public loos will come up anytime anyone Googles that and um, with their location and directions how to get to them and so forth. And of course, the, each of those loos may have, uh, in the, or currently have, different types of facilities and of course the changing places will have uh, their own unique characters coming up into the future. So it will be very useful for any visitors but also any of the public in town makes it very easy to find those um, laboratories. Yeah, thank you, and, and I can su support this. It seems sensible to me to use a platform that already exists to be able to map the assets that we have as opposed to um, running off to build um, yet another app uh, for those purposes. Councillor Benson Pope. A question of someone, Mr Chairman. Um, and I think this is entirely sensible, and there are lots of, I've also found on Google lots of things that are wrong, um, but our staff aren't in a position to do any upgrading of Google Maps, and I just think the language in the second bit is not quite correct, if you see what I mean. Yeah, uh, and ensure that, to ensure their accuracy would allow staff to contact Google to tell them to get their shit together. Well, everybody else has done it, why shouldn't I? We're very close. Um, so, I think I think this is clear enough in terms of the in, the the intended purpose. Don't panic. Further speakers. Oh, sorry, Councillor Staines. I can uh, support these resolutions. There are twenty public toilets that appear on Google Maps currently. Um, and undoubtedly there will be some that are missed, but it is possible for anyone to notify Google of a public toilet that we have forgotten about, and they will then add that, they'll check it and then add it. Yes, I think um, anyone can make a submission to Google about where a public toilet is or should be, but that doesn't carry the weight of the council doing it. So, I mean, this doesn't mean that council, some particular member of council staff has to do it, but they can authorise someone to do it. The council is the authorised owner of those Google Place listings, and so it's important that the request to Google comes from um, council. There is a, quite a significant difference between uh, a member of the public saying it and the council saying it, and Google takes that into account when they do make the changes. And also, one of the reasons for the review is that there then will be a consistency in the listings, because at the moment there are quite a few showing on Google, but there is an inconsistency across some of them as they've probably been put on by different people at different times, or some just simply evolved by people mentioning that they're there. And so this way we can have a uh, council consistency across all of the listings and make sure that all um, public facilities are included. I will put it all those in favour. Aye. Those against? That's agreed. No consequential motions on the rates and revenue policy for how we fund. No, no user pays for the toilets. Uh, I will uh, move that we adjourn the meeting through until one o'clock. Seconded Councillor Gary. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
One and all. We're on item 10 at a time that suits you all. Uh, Dunedin Performing Arts Venue Consultation Feedback, Mr Pickford, Ms Patterson, welcome. Anything that either of you would like to add by way of introduction? No, we're happy to take questions. And I have a question for the, well, many questions, but it might be helpful to ask this one at the front end of the Chief Executive around uh, the option, whatever it is, option three around re-engaging with uh, stakeholders and reporting back to council. Um, what a, what a realistic timeline for that work would be. I mean, maybe, perhaps it's a much a question for you uh, on that, but... Well, in time, I would suggest for the December meetings on the annual plan, so the work might be done in advance of that, but reporting back to feed into that process. Questions? Councillor Elder. Um, on reading the submissions, there seemed to be a clear theme that, in fact, a music venue and a theatre venue are two very different beasts. And um, so I was just wondering whether you could comment on that. So that's true. We've had feedback through this ongoing through this process that they are different beasts because of the requirements of the acoustic design for both. It's difficult to get something that, that works for both really well. So that would be a, a true statement. Um, Cara, do you want to add anything from the... Um, I, I agree, and I think that initially the, the brief was looking at our performing arts ecosystem, but we were also focusing on professional theatre, and I think that um, music has been part of the um, exploration from the consultant team and has been part of the conversations that we've had with the community, but the, the larger sort of 600 to 800 standing uh, music space has actually always sat separately from this particular piece of work. So, in your opinion, you could it, it, it would be unwise to put the two together because of that? Well, if it's fair to ask staff their opinions, councillor, but... It, the only thing I'd say is it would allow... The, the, the option that we have here, um, either the Athenaeum or the Mayfair, would suit music performance, but probably at an acoustic type uh, performance rather than a rock band. A gig, yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I did have another weak question, but it's gone out of my head, so... I'll... Can I ask, I'll ask a similar question slightly differently. Do you think it is realistic to expect all of the uh, gaps perceived or otherwise that have been identified by submitters in the wider ecosystem to be addressed by a single space or building? I think that's that's very true. It is what we've what we've arrived at here is, is is meeting a fair amount of the brief, but several submitters were still wanting things that we can't capture as part of this, such as the Vali Haka. Um, we can't capture um, a medium-sized music venue, but this does deliver in the flexible auditorium with the retail, food and beverage, the back of, back of the house, front of house spaces, and uh, probably crucially the the studios as well. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. One of the other things, and you sort of slightly um, raised that around the studios when you say that, but is a, there's quite a major issue with a lack of um, rehearsal space for bands too. You know, there obviously is for theatre as well, but any ideas on what, you know, like sort of where do you see us moving forward there with that? I suppose that's out, outside the scope of this project. It did, did come up, as, as Cara mentioned, but it, this is outside the those practice venues are really outside of this. That's a separate conversation that the Toy team have been having with and will continue to have with, with performers, mm -hmm. um, because it is uh, a challenge when you have um, landlords who want to utilize spaces uh, and get a return on them, um, but you've still got that need from musicians to have a practice space. But we will facilitate that where we can. But mm. it's outside of this particular question, I guess. The, do, you, do you think some, and you might not be able to answer this, but do you think that some submitters, and the reason I asked that is that we got a submitter who was in favour of the Athenaeum, and he said to us while we're all sitting here, he said, look, I, I'm a bit 
scared to speak out and say this for fear that saying I want the Athenaeum will put me at um, an opposing um, uh, thing with banned people. And he said it's because his feeling was that it had created a bit of a rift between the band and um, the theatre um, industry, which that's not what we intended. But do you think that, you know, are you seeing a little bit of that? And do you think some people avoided submitting because further, of their fear further, of that? Further to my earlier was advice, I don't think it's fair to us to have now to speak on behalf of submitters oh, oh. or people who chose not to submit. I did proviso with my question saying you might not be able to answer that, but I've given them the opportunity. I'd like to give them the opportunity if they want to. I think well, that's fair. I don't, I don't think we can answer that. Sorry. No, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there's an ongoing issue with obviously the fortune before it closed down couldn't cover its ongoing costs. How are we going to resolve that if we agree to go ahead with the Athenaeum? So the, the, the closure of the fortune, I guess we've covered in earlier reports, but just to summarise, I mean, it was a smaller theatre, 220 seats. That doesn't attract the, the, the touring performances um, that require 3 350 in order to make it viable financially. Mm. Um, also, that space at the, um, the 231 Stewart Street wasn't, wasn't ideal. It was compromised. And obviously, if you were a, um, you were a, a visitor, you were actually there for a performance, you experienced that, that poor accessibility, um, and it was, it was damp and cold. So um, in terms of viability, what, what the team have looked at and have, have we presented here is a fit for purpose, um, medium-sized theatre, which will attract those, those um, those touring shows, but I guess more importantly, it does would attract um, CNZ funding. So what we've included here in terms of the raw figures um, were were very high level figures, but didn't include a CNZ subsidy <coughs> because it, we don't know what that would be. But to give you uh, an idea, we received between 500, 500 or, or Fortune received between 500 and 600,000, which aren't included in these figures because CNZ aren't can't really make a commitment at this stage. Also, food and beverage was limited at the Fortune. Uh, food and beverage, if the Athenaeum was chosen, would be a lot more viable, and I think we've talked about that in the report. Yeah. It does make the business model a lot more appealing. And, f and further to that, the Fortune was run as a repertory model, uh, which isn't the proposal here as far as I understand it. That's correct. Sorry, carry on. So uh, quite a few people have said to me, well, you're still, the council still owns the Fortune. Why aren't you going to revamp that or do something with that? Can you... I guess we, we covered the, 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 short, the shortcomings of the fortune um, in, the, in the earlier reports. So again, that would still be a compromise model. It's still only a relatively small space. Um, the, the building envelope is protected. And so with the Athenaeum and the Mayfair, it does give you that size, uh, a bigger size, to, to, um, which improves the business model. In the Athenaeum, would we be able to have, is there room for us to have a smaller theatre as well? At this stage, it looks like the Athenaeum would provide the medium-sized theatre plus one to two studios, but that's really high level at this stage. But it does indicate that we do have some space to play with, which I think, as we've talked about, is, is really critical on delivering on that original brief that we got from the um, back from the community of what they really need. And do you think the owner's open to sell the building? Conversations with uh, Mr. Forbes have indicated he would be willing to, to um, give council first right of refusal or to talk about some other options um, that would um, hand over the building. It could be a lease to buy scheme. It, it, it would, um, those conversations he's really open to and obviously this kind of um, partnership is quite unusual um, for a theatre development and probably gives council some risk mitigation and some opportunities for um, a, a good outcome for both parties. Councillor Vanivis. The We had a lot of submitters express real concern about the, the Athenaeum. Um, people that use the, 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 the theatres, um, especially, I'm thinking of, was it Craig, one of the musicians, Oxo Cubans, etc. And uh, his concern, one of his concerns about the Athenaeum was moving gear in and out. Um, the access at the back is very limited and at the wrong level. Access from the uh, octagon has got to be constrained. 
how would you perceive a lot of gear being moved in and out of the Athenaeum space? We haven't got into that much detail. We have had preliminary conversations with Mr. Forbes around access to that loading dock at the back, as you, as you mentioned. Um, but it is constrained, but it is workable, we believe. Um, and so we've, we've, we, we did note that comment from the submitters. Um, but so that's the, the, um, the regent uses that same uh, area at the back. So whether it's that option or whether there are some other options we've also been talking to in terms of uh, providing access uh, for loading, um, we'd have to work that through. But at this stage, we're confident that, that can work. Right. You haven't gotten into the detail, but you you said that it, it would be workable. Is that workable with a lift? Because it's far lower, for instance, than the region. Pot potentially. But we haven't gone into that much detail. Okay. At this stage, it's just a high-level discussion right. with what could work. And when you say that um, you could understand that you can't really make a lot of noise in, in the um, Athenaeum or the Mayfair, that bands would need to sort of be acoustic or whatever, what is it, I understand that the Athenaeum has got a lot of fairly uh, sensitive um, places immediately adjoining, and including um, uh, residential, um, the uh, Regent Theatre uh, and um, the Kraken, oh, forget what that building's called behind. Um, but what are the um, reasons why, especially in the evenings, you couldn't have high levels of sound uh, at the um, Mayfair? It backs onto a supermarket and a largely unused mall otherwise. Um, if I understand the question, Councillor, so you're raising a question about the um whether you could have a noisy venue at the Mayfair? Yes. No, there's nothing, um, I guess with acoustic treatment, you, can, you want to try and mitigate <coughs> any sound leakage for, for whatever site it might be. So I guess with the, with the Mayfair, that could be achieved, as it could be achieved for the, for the Athenaeum as well. So those options, but again, we haven't gone into that level of detail to see what level of acoustic treatment would be required. But other than talk to the theatre experts and say what could work. Um, but you're correct, it could, uh, you could use the, the Mayfair or the Athenaeum uh, with acoustic treatment, um, that would work. My question really was, do you need any acoustic treatment for the Mayfair given that you've got no sensitive neighbours? I guess you'd have to look at um, that as part of a design because you want to try and mitigate any of that noise leakage irrespective of whether you have neighbours currently or not uh, for a bit of future proofing. But as I say, it's not that level of detail we've gone into. But it, Potentially, um, it might, um, that might be achievable, particularly because we are looking at a, um, a taking back as to a shell almost for both of those options. So it would be possible for both of those. Thank you. Councillor Lord. <coughs> yes, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a question for you to answer or it's a political one, but I'll ask it anyway and you can tell me. So, so my question is, if we invested in the Mayfair, which comes at a higher price tag according to the high level, um, the, the paper. If we did, that, that's one option. What are the options then for the Athenaeum? And we could argue it's not our problem, but what other things would that be capable of? And then versus if we invested in the Athenaeum, are we then not making it doubly hard for the Mayfair to, you know, who are on a protected site, historic, um, just wondering how that would stack up. So Mr Forbes has indicated he will probably create something that may have some smaller performance uh, practice spaces for example. He's keen on doing something in that creative space but it would not be on the scale of, um, of a, of a medium-sized theatre for example. Um, but he hasn't really firmed that up beyond he has this as, as his first option. He obviously wants to work with council on delivering a medium-sized venue. Um, but I guess the, the second part of your question is more of a political decision. I was asking a question of, and perhaps for Mr. Logie, for, by way of context in terms of the urgency of the decision or otherwise, when is the money and the capital budget to do the work? So uh, just the build starts and there's a bit of design work in 24-25, the build proper starts in 25-26, uh, the commissioning and uh, the operation becoming active is 28-29, so it's a fair way out in the 10-year plan. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor, oh, that was you done. Councillor Reddick. Uh, officially about the Mayfair, were there any noise complaints after the Midge Marsden gig there a week ago? Sorry, Councillor, I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry? I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. Well, certainly not. I didn't see anything in the newspaper or publicly. Um, the, we had a presentation uh, two weeks ago from the people from the Mayfair who seemed to think that the theatre would be brought up to a suitable standard much less expensively than what we have on the reports in front of us. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Yes, I was present for that submission. Um, the, there was a report done in 2009 which estimated the costs on the Mayfair would be 7.3 million at that stage. So I was curious how um, that figure came about. Yeah. Um, so that's, this is the report that we had um, looked at and revisited to see what um, would be required. The Mayfair does require a lot of work in terms of the, the earthquake prone issues. Potentially, we need to look at that again. The electrical um, fire egress um, and the HVAC, again, is um, the heating, ventilation and air conditioning um, needs replacement. So they're, they're significant pieces of work that need significant funding. So um, I wasn't too sure how the Mayfair arrived at that lower figure. Yes, did the 7.9 or 3, whatever figure it was, cover those things, HVAC, electrical e egress and fire and safety and Indeed. earthquake? Cover all correct. of that? That's correct, yes. Yep. Yet we have this new and improved figure of 15 million. This what was done in, in February 2009. So, the, so 10 years, yeah. subsequent work has indicated that figure has um, obviously escalated. Um, but the scope of this, I'm pretty correct in saying, was pretty much what we've sort of come back with, but obviously the costs have increased substantially. Yeah, well, double, yeah. But uh, that's, the, uh, and that's on the structural side, and on the other half of the picture is 15, 15 million for the fit-out. And so that was the more, they didn't really, the fortune, the um, Mayfair people didn't really speak to the structural side, they spoke to the fit-out side, and their order of magnitude was just in one or two, a few million, as opposed to the 15 that we have before us. Can you speak to that, please? I'm not really sure how I... Um, I don't know how they arrived at their figures. All I can tell you is that the, when this initial work was done, about 17-odd million, this was to, to uh, create a fit-for-purpose um, venue use in, the, in the Mayfair. So the work that we have done um, basically updates that work and recosts it. So that is why these figures have escalated from what was done in 2009 to the present day. Um, and they've just been checked by uh, another engineering firm and been uh, um, quantity surveyed. So that's been, but again, very high level. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. But that's really how we've arrived at these figures. No, because, uh, well, what I was <clears throat> hearing about that one, the 15 million was not the, the structural upgrading was not questioned by the Mayfair people. They were worried about the, they were concerned about the excessive amount for the theatre fit out. So that's my question. So the theatre fit out was done um, on a per square metre basis and we benchmarked that against the court and uh, the Waikato Theatre um, in Hamilton. So those, that's where those figures have come from. So they haven't, they, that's specialist theatre fit out, which is all the things around lighting um, and the, the sound system. All of those things that are particular to a theatre were done benchmark nationally. And so what's a per square metre rate? We looked at the um, Athenaeum um, footprint and we looked at um, the Mayfair. And that's, where the, that's how those figures have been arrived at. Uh, so does that mean that these figures for the theatre were not discussed with the Mayfair people in advance of the report or at, at any stage during this latest report? So they have seen the, it was, this is the original report that they, the 17 million um, was actually their report, um, which they shared with us. 
Um, so the, the other reports that we've used to influence, uh, to, um, uh, as part of this report that we put for you today, we haven't gone into much detail with the, with the Mayfair because we wanted to just talk to council first. Um, but there are obviously some, um, some questions and, and conversations that we'll have with the Mayfair after this, depending on council's decision. Councillor Elder. Um, three questions. Um, in your view, um, if it were, and I think we're clarifying um, quite clearly music versus theatre, but in your view, would having both mean that there could be conflicts of acts as well, so people wouldn't be able to use it because there's another thing happening? It would be a great situation if there was a, a, a high demand for it. Um, and, <laughs> but and music so, but, versus uh, theatre. Yeah, I, I guess I go back to my earlier point that, that, the, that music and performance of um, a play, for example, aren't, aren't best served by um, a single, um, single venue. They can't do justice to both. Okay. Um, but you can have, yeah. You can have small little You can things. have smaller acoustics, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it could be, could be doable. <clears throat> Okay, um, and it's my understanding, uh, have we got that um, agreement with Laurie Forbes that it is a lease to buy situation? No, not at this stage because obviously we cannot make that with, without council's decision. Okay, um, and the other question I had was, is, is this bottle um, able to be a trust or a charity um, so that they could get say sponsorship and people could get one third back etc so like a big sponsor or whatever hopefully so if a if an option is chosen um one of the options is chosen and then the next piece of work alongside the building piece and the design piece would be to think about the, the governance structure um, we're not proposing in here and it's not proposed anywhere i don't think in those other reports that council operate this but it is really it is over to a trust another body to operate it. Um, we're not theatre experts, it's really up to um, um, a, a, a separate body to do that work. They would have the opportunity to fundraise. If you look at um, something like the court in Christchurch, operates on a, um, it has a, a subsidy from council, and, but it also has a, a wealth of fundraising uh, sponsors and partners that it um, helps underwrite that. But as I said before, we haven't incorporated any of those, we haven't done those estimates, okay. other than just a very high level um, some commercial operation, such as food and beverage, which we know would uh, offset the costs. But all of that other stuff, um, that extra fundraising would be would really down to a trust. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, I had a question around consultation because this is something that came up during the submissions and we had the conflation of music venue and theatre venues so setting that aside because this was a theatre venue that was being scoped. Um, I note in phase one 140 hours uh, and 160 stakeholders um, were, were spoken to. Was the confusion, my question is, was that comment about consultation around the fact that you weren't able to release phase three to the theatre community because they had to come to council first. Do you believe that's where that comment came from? I think the the delay that we had during the, during that COVID period, um, and the the fact that we started out with quite a big vision that we um, that would basically be a large footprint and a significant capital investment. We then um, obviously council decided this is a more affordable, um, deliverable and we looked for a single site. So that was that work that was delivered back in December 2020. So there was a big gap between that initial check-in that we had at the end of phase one, uh, which was in March uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the community, because we weren't able to um, discuss with them where we'd landed um, officially, because we were um, in uh, ongoing negotiations, commercial negotiations, um, it was very difficult for them, and I think they felt, um, understandably, that, that things were happening without them. And, and we, we accept that as a criticism, um, and that could have been better. Um, the, it's interesting, the, the, the feedback that we've had to the, so the, the Phase 3 report, which is, um, obviously it, um, came out as part of the Council agenda, has been very positive. But we haven't been able to do that. We couldn't do that before it appeared on the agenda, before Council got to see it first. 
Um, but it's just with COVID, with the delay, um, with the commercial sensitivity issues, it's just meant that people have felt um, a bit disenfranchised from the from the journey. Yes. So thank you for that answer. And my second question was just to clarify and test something, and you may or may not be able to answer, but given the phase three report now is in the public arena and, and theatre people have had the opportunity to have a look at it um, briefly, um, I just want to see if the feedback you've had to that, and you might have answered this already, Mr Pickford, matches what I was hearing through the Creative Janine partnership, which was basically, we want you to get on with it, and, and they were very clear about their, their response. Have you had a clear response of feedback from the theatre community since they've read Phase 3? Um, I wouldn't want to speak for the entire theatre community, but we have had um, a, a number of conversations that have been led through from Stage South, um, and the response has been really positive, um, and almost like this would have been really great if we'd had this information when we were um, working through the, um, the tenure plan consultation. Just to be clear, though, we haven't taken any decisions that the scope is narrowed to being a theatre at this point. I mean, performing arts is slightly wider than that, and while the input of the theatre community is important, it's not the sole scope of this work at this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, <coughs> thank you Your Worship. It's on, um, <clears throat> on your report, um, thank, you for, thank you for which, in paragraph 35, you make a, a, a quite unequivocal statement about the further discussions with Charcoal Blue in respect of the Athenaeum site. Um, but uh, two paragraphs later, this, um, this question rears its head again about the music capacity and the size of any such venue. And I think earlier on there was mention of a six to 700 standing. Um, <clears throat> is, that, is it the case that neither of these op theatre options meets the need, the expressed needs of the big, big end of the music industry? That's correct. Um, the five to six hundred standing venue um, did, was mentioned as part of the original uh, feedback as phase one. Because we were looking at the, um, the, the, the work that came out of the demise of the fortune, um, a, a flexible format space which could meet the needs of a perhaps smaller music uh, performance but it doesn't meet that. So um, this, either Athenaeum or, or Mayfair, could meet um, 500 standing for a music venue. Uh, but as I said before, it keeps coming back to that um, acoustic design being compromised for both. Um, yeah. Uh, and how does the Mayfair perform on that 500 standing um, demand? We haven't done that work, sorry. It's, we, it'd be a bit difficult. I would only be guessing, so... Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hillahan. Thank you. Um, yes, my question is similar to Councillor Gary's um, around the consultation. Um, <clears throat> do you feel that there's been enough consultation now, or do you think we need to go back? You know, like, do, is there a feeling in the arts sector that you're hearing that they want more discussion before a decision's made? And you might not be able to answer that, but, you know... There, there, may, not be a, there may not be a singular opinion either. Well, that's right, but... Um, I'd just like to say that there, there isn't a singular opinion. I mean, yes. we have had conversations with some um, theatre companies and theatre practitioners who've said, actually, you've talked to us up to our eyeballs. Um, we just want you to get on with it. Yep. And then we have had other conversations with other theatre practitioners who have express their concern at not being able to see the phase three report and not understanding the yeah. detail. So I think um, that, that's my right. response. Yes. Uh, um, you know, there's going to be, by the sound of it with this report, there's going to be quite a long period before we actually even get a theatre. So how will, obviously, the, I suppose the arts sector has just survived so far, they'll just have to keep doing what they've been doing, or is there any plans for interim support in the meantime, is there anything we can do, or, or it's just fend for your lives? <laughs> it is a challenge for um, performing arts practitioners. So we are obviously there at Toy Team are working with um, mm. with that uh, with that 
cohort and trying to identify uh, potential spaces that would meet their needs, but there, there isn't anything that really meets that medium-sized venue that we, we're currently talking about now. Um, and th that is what it is. Um, but we, we will obviously work with, um, uh, with, with that group, and if we do find something that is at least an interim measure, then we'll, we'll help them through that. Right. Um, in this budget, is the, is, has it been included in there, um, the 17 million, that there's a bit of a, um, a, an amount in there to subsidise ongoing running costs? Because otherwise it's quite possible, you know, well, certainly for the first year or two, that we can expect they probably can't meet those. But if it gives them time to get sponsors, get you know sorted, and get some big um, gigs, big acts coming in, bigger, um, have we have we built that into the budget? So, so just to be clear, the 17 million is not not our operating costs. The 17 million is towards the specialist, uh, is the DCC capital. Uh, for, I think if we talk about Athenaeum, yeah. So that's the DCC capital cost, and that that solely is the specialist theatre fit out. The operational right. cost and the, the operational subsidy um, is something like 900,000 that council would be, um, that's currently in, um, in there as a, as a, uh, I suppose, a rates funded subsidy. But as I've said before, it, it would be offset by Creative New Zealand, by other fundraising sources, but I haven't been able to include that in this budget because we just don't know what those no, are yet. But yeah. based on the way that the Fortune um, used to receive funding from CNZ uh, and could potentially have grown that, um, and we would obviously look to grow that as part of any new theatre development, um, then, yeah, there would be offsets. So it, the previous report did talk to that in quite some detail around the total operating expenditure for the Athenaeum was around four and a half million. Um, but that included, obviously, the rental, the borrowing interest costs and the depreciation. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, thank you. Um, a lot of people are saying that the costs seem to be really high, and some people have questioned why we can't spend five or seven million, say, for example, on somewhere like Sammy's and get a venue that will be fine for bands to go into. Is there, have we looked at that? Have we done sort of a few, you know, let's revise that again, see what we can do, looking at things like that? So uh, you might remember in that, in that report that we brought um, back in December, uh, we did look at Sammy's and presented Sammy's as an option. Yes. Um, and it was around 19 million to really get it to a shell state. So, right. so again, 4 million, which is currently in the budget, uh, 4.8 million, I think, in the budget, is not adequate okay. to, to address the issues that Sammy's, the Sammy's building has plus then provide some kind of um, fit out. It obviously wouldn't be a specialist theatre fit out, it was a music venue, um, yeah. but it would need uh, a significant investment as well. Huge money, isn't it? Mm, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions from me before we push on. The, the, the people for whom, uh, the people who are giving you the feedback to just get on with it, are they aware that the build isn't happening until 2025, and that the design work won't happen until the year before. I guess it's because I understand the concern about delay, uh, but there's still plenty of time between now and when it is budgeted to be spent. The, the whatever is ended up decided. Yeah, um, I think I think that we've been really clear in our um, conversations with the community around the time that this process will take. And, and I, I guess we are presenting a report today about some options, and I mean, if an option is chosen, then there's still a lot of work to happen around the governance model and um, ha all, all of the work that fits in with choosing an option. So I think that the community are aware that there is still a long way away for this project. Yeah, that, that's that's heartening. Thank you. So, in the in the report where it talks to option three, uh, re-engage with stakeholders, and in the disadvantages, it says um, f uh, further delay in future provision of the performing arts ecology potential uh, less professional theatre and performing arts activity continued audience erosion. That those disadvantages only hold if the work as a whole gets pushed out beyond twenty five, twenty six, and that if if that timeline is still met, then it won't have any material difference between 
picking either of the other options. So with option three, if we were effectively saying um, re-engage and it would be part of a, um, the annual plan, um, so in a year, a year later, so it's just deferring it by a year effectively. Why, why would it though? I mean, I, I guess that's my question. So if we, if the planning work isn't until 24-25 in the budget and the construction starts in 25-26, how is um, a, a, a period of six months or wherever at this point how, why does that inherently push everything else back? I mean, for the Athenaeum, for example, um, Mr Forbes won't um, progress any work until he has a commitment from Council, and we have an agreement with him. So I guess until Council is able to make a firm decision, um, then there will be a delay. But I guess that could be months, it could be up to a year. That doesn't answer my question, though, yeah. Mr Pickford. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to a delay, yes, a delay in a decision that we make about what it is that we end up wanting to do. But what I don't understand is how that necessarily translates to a delay in that eventual project being delivered, given that it's not for another five years, the capital work and the planning work a year before that, so the substantial planning work for a year before that. You can. Mine doesn't seem to be that successful. So what won't get done between now and next March that would, was going to be done? I think it goes back to the work that we were proposing to do after an option was chosen, which is around exploring the governance model, starting those conversations with all the funders, um, doing, doing all of that kind of pre-work um, that would enable the work to happen on time for that, for the 24, 25, 26, 27. So then you could, in theory, with a delay, run another parallel stream. So you could have a design stream, a governance and funding stream, and a so you could run multiple streams rather than do them slightly as sequentially as they are laid out at the minute. Yes, that's true. Councillor, where are we? Councillor Barker, and then Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Risha. I just want to ask a few questions that may appear unrelated, but in my mind they're related. I just wonder, um, what is our subsidy to the Regent Theatre? Uh, we don't. We, we currently don't have a subsidy to the Regent Theatre. So. Oh, OK. I saw that it was $100,000 in the past, but that must have changed. It. So what's our subsidy to Dunedin Venues? to enable community access. Don't we have a, a, a figure? Was it around 300,000? Those are two separate questions. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. For Carolyn's that. here and she can probably pull them up. So the DVML is 750 for the community access? 750,000. I think there is a payment to the region, but I'll, yeah, but I'll just get Carolyn to check that. We, and we still own the region and yeah. cover the costs yeah. of yeah, maintaining sorry. the building? Yeah, apologies, Sophie. There is a, um, a property arrangement grant with the Regent Theatre at 95k. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's also, there's also a hundred thousand dollar subsidy re-ticketing that we have with them. So, do we have an overall package that we'll get an answer on that? Okay, thank you. Um, during the submission process, we heard around access questions around access to the town hall. So the over, there is a, di a different sum in the $750,000 between access to the stadium or access to, Dunedin, to the Dunedin Centre, the town hall? It's the total, and initially the community access grant was made available for use, community use of the stadium, mm -hmm. but some, I think about six or seven years ago, we brought in that out to be any venue managed by DVML is qualifies for people to access that grant, or apply for it at least. Thank you. My third question is around the Outer Toy strategy, and I was just 2015, and I was looking through, and it said that there would be um, a communications plan to be developed to ensure the community is kept up to date with the progress and achievements of Outer Toy. Is there a communication plan that's publicly available? I'm, I'm, I, mean, I don't know that you've made the connection. But I'm struggling to see the direct connection. Between oh, because of the amount of submissions we had that were unhappy about the process. So therefore, I'm asking. In the in the strategy, it said that there would be a communication plan. So, if that has happened, is it working? 
and they're following on from that, it says that there will be a community event every year where the annual progress report is presented a triennial hui, and I was wondering if those things have happened to enable the strategy to progress. Sorry, Councillor, we, there was, there has been a hui. Um, we're just trying to remember when it last was. Um, and there is a report which is part of the community and culture, which is tabled yearly, which is an update on, on progress around uh, against our toy strategy. Um, but in terms of the hui, neither of us can remember the date. Sorry. So in the six years since we signed off on the strategy, there's just been one hui, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I'm just going on to page 98 of um, the report where it's talking about completing the ecology and I just wondered, um, overall understanding of this, it sort of says that if we pick one theatre option that it won't be um, completing the whole infrastructure ecology, um, that it is <coughs> while it establishes an urgent need for a flexi-form theatre, dance venue and foray Tapari Haka with a community hub, it would not be achieved by renovating the ethanam alone. And then it had a whole list of other um, items to be considered. And I wonder whether th this theatre had been consist considered in a holistic ecosystem view or just sort of coming out as a, as a theatre option. So you might remember, Councillor, that in, on that 14th of December report, we talked about this issue around the ecology and the importance of any. Um, any option that Council chose saw it as part of a wider, a networked approach, as opposed to a one-stop one, si a, a one shop for everything meeting the, the, um, the needs identified as part of that earlier phase one report. It was always going to be just a, a part of an ecology. So we've taken the approach that um, this was the cornerstone and there would be uh, other other things that could be provided by council in time, or they could be provided by other means that would that would end up de um, delivering on that that um, that overall ecology, performing arts ecology. Fair enough. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Millick. Thank you, Worship. Um, on page seventy-three point twenty-four, talk about a council noted this report on 29th of April, twenty nineteen. I was trying to go back and find the actual what we'd noted, and I couldn't actually find a meeting on the 29th of April. There were some community there were some um, committee meetings the week before, so I'm not sure if that's what it was. Can you tell me what meeting that was that we endorsed the commencement of Part Two, of Phase Two? Uh, number page 73, number 24. 29th of April 2019. Is that 20? Well, no, it was a long time ago. I, the only reason is that I couldn't find a meeting on that date and I was looking for that. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, just, and then when the fortune was running and it was a smaller theatre, one of the commentaries has been that we cannot get national performing um, troops to come to Dunedin. Presumably, if that was too small, then there must have been evidence that they were not coming. Can you give us a list of ones that didn't come during that period because of the size of the fortune? I don't think we have that. It's, um, this was the, the um, information that came back through the Phase 1 report, um, that really to make a, a touring show viable, it has to be in that 350, 300, 350 size in order to make it viable, but I, I don't have that information to hand, sorry. I guess the question would be then, Okay, you don't have it to hand, but the argument is that if you didn't have that size, it wouldn't be viable, then the presumption would be that, that when we only had the fortune and it was a certain size, there would have been evidence that people were not coming because of lack of viability. So. Um, I think that there's also, there's also the model of the Fortune Theatre that, that, that didn't allow the flexibility for touring companies to come in, so they could use the studio space downstairs, which is like 150 seats, I think. Um, you know, and... and I recall that companies like Takirua and Indian Inc and that those companies that t are funded to tour nationally would find it difficult to find a space to present here um, if they couldn't get into the fortune because of the programming. So that there were the size issue but also availability around programming. So the it, model as well. 
well, the model, I can see the model. Um, I, um, that's kind of a minor point to some extent, except, except that it has been stated that you needed to be bigger than the fortune was in order to get those troops to come, and yet they were coming except when they couldn't get in because of booking issues. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to the running annual running costs that, that are in the papers um, of, I'm going to go back to page 76, um, for the Athenaeum, it's 4.6 million. Um, You've made the commentary that, that they would be expected to form a trust. Would that be, would the trust then be reducing that? Because then our, our, only our obligation is only less than a million. Is that? Yes, that, that's correct. We would provide a, an operating grant. So with the, with the Fortune, for example, um, they had five to 600,000 from memory from CNZ. We, council provided 140,000. Right. But just if I can just clarify, I think what staff were intending to say is there's that piece of work to be done on what governance model it will be, and so a tr there's been no decision taken yet what it will be. It may be a trust, it could be a company, it could be anything. I guess it's just in terms of us considering then we should be looking more at the capital number than the operating number. I mean, are we? Uh, my concern is, I mean, my want to clarify around is that we're not guaranteeing a capital uh, an op. Uh, an operating expenditure as high as this, and and if so, how would we offset it, or are we? Because then I was going to ask questions around salaries, actually. Um. So we just need to be clear that the operating cost of the 4.6 million obviously includes depreciation, interest on the money that we need to borrow to do the fit out, but it also includes a rental payment, because obviously we don't own the building, so therefore we would have to rent it, or somebody would have to rent it, and obviously there's the there's the maintenance of our of the fit out. So ultimately, somebody has to pay for that, um, and it's, it's, it's how much revenue can be generated by a trust running the, running the facility versus the fixed cost of having the facility. And the rental cost is largely the difference between the Mayfair. I mean, I know there's other differences, but that Mayfair Athenaeum difference is a big chunk of that is the rental requirement, the Athenaeum. But, it, but we are also looking at then, just, I just want to get myself clear around this, because there's 1.1 million up to 1.4 million in salaries in, in the reports that support this for the, for the actual people running the operation. Are we expecting, where are we putting in a contributing factor, Creative New Zealand, we put in a contributing factor and we expect the trust to run the rest. I guess the question that I would ask is, how will this venue perform better than, than, than the fortune did given that it was receiving these external assistances and, and failed to be viable. I think the, the, the issues that we came across as part of the um, phase one report which pointed to issues with the fortune's viability around its size, as we've talked about, but also their lack of a lack uh, or challenge around the ability to, to fundraise effectively. I mean, they, they did a great job with fundraising with the resources they had. But looking at the, the landscape now, if you look at um, the way the court works, for example, in Christchurch, a lot of, they have a, a lot of resource that they they, um, they they put into and they invest in in terms of getting a return, so that offsets their their running costs. Um, so what we try to do is say that there is a there is a requirement for uh, for staffing um, around that fundraising. But it, it, as the chief executive pointed out, it could be a trust. There could be other ways of doing it, uh, but we haven't done that work yet. But what we obviously want to do is minimise the, the cost of ratepayers. So, um, but there are other models around um, other theatres operating around New Zealand that um, that are operating well, but none of them make a profit. There is always a cost to it, obviously. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, we heard through deliberations a very passionate um, submission by Jeremy Anderson and he talked about a pop-up temporary space and understanding that no space is going to be nearby in the next three to four years plus. Does, did that have any merit and does that look at ability to engage with the community in that space or that, through that period and also um, do we have any indication of costs and location? So we are um, in discussions at the moment um, around a temporary pop-up space, um, something that would fill, fill that gap. It wouldn't be on this scale, but it certainly would fill a need. 
um, but it will be, uh, we just we need to resolve some issues before that could be um, progressed. But um, we're confident we will have a, a temporary pop-up venue that would, would meet a need. Councillor Reddick. Uh, <clears throat> just a question of clarity on page 76. The Athenaeum options, there'd be a rental of 1.7 million per year. Uh, so that um, the developer could recover their capital and also total operating expenditure of 4.6. Are they additional? So that'll be... Uh, yes. Yep. Thank you. And... Um, Sorry, um, so the so the 4.6... Um, Separate to the 1.5. This includes the 1.5? It includes, includes the 1.5, yes, that's right. It includes the 1.5? Yes, correct, yeah. So that being the case, how come the so you, does it suggest well that suggests that the operating expenditure of the Athenaeum would be less than the Mayfair if we take out that rental? I think that's correct. Yes. Why is the why would it be more expensive to run the Mayfair? The business model um, of the two, when you compare them. Um, is affected primarily by the, the location that they're in. So the, the daytime, nighttime economy factor does make a difference to um, the viability of both and the bottom line of both. And so the, the advice that we've received is that the, the sighting of theatre in, the, um, in the octagon provides opportunities to offset the cost more than it would with the Mayfair. And that's not to say that um, if the Mayfair was chosen it couldn't help, uh, it, it would help de develop that daytime, nighttime economy. But if you've got a bar or a cafe operating as part of a theatre, um, having it in the octagon obviously is uh, with the footfall, uh, the increased footfall compared to the Mayfair, uh, just makes it a, a better option in terms of business model. Yes, how uh, both of these options suggest that it's, it's near enough to $100,000 a week in income they have to get. How will they do that in such a small theatres? So I think we've talked about the 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 expenditure that would, that um, that we're talking about for these theatres would be offset by, um, and again we haven't included these, but whether it's a, a rate, a, obviously partly a rate subsidy, but also fundraising. So we want to try and minimise any of that rates rates impact, but we are looking at obviously a sponsorships, CNZ funding. Um, and obviously things like food and beverage, those things that would offset those, uh, those costs. Do you have, we've just seen the Mayfair have a concert, a very successful full house concert, but do you have any comment to make on the relative popularity in Dunedin of you know, 500 seat or 400 seat music gigs versus theater gig, theater performances? No, I don't we can comment on that. Do you have any comment on that admission price for each? No comment on that. Fairly broad range is what I would observe. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, during the New Zealand Festival in Wellington, you've probably seen this, Cara, but um, they have Dance Palais that's a set-up, pop-up, Theatre, have you you've seen that? Yeah, it's amazing. I love it. It's really cool. Is that something we could maybe consider to put in the octagon or something during this time that we have no theatre? We could then have something for a performance arts. You know, it's it's easy to put up. It's made to travel, um, and it seats a reasonable amount of people. Has room for dancing and theatre and singing and performance and tables and. Yes, I mean, and these are great ideas. Um, and, um, lots of arts festivals create pop-up venues and do some really yeah. good activations. Um, but again, a little bit outside the scope of this, but it is obviously related. And yes, that's it's possible. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we could solve some of our problems if we um, looked at the... It's not, doesn't probably come under the umbrella of our toy, but DVML have some wonderful buildings and you know that and great venues so um but some people in the arts sector have been saying look the costs are just far too high 
I mean, right now we've got an issue that the city hasn't got a, a band venue, hasn't got a um, or a good larger live band venue, and it hasn't got a professional theatre anymore. Is it possible? I mean, it could save us a lot of money too in the interim. Anyway, if we um, maybe is there any way we can look at dropping some of that the cost to the you know local acts to use some of those venues? I can. Oh. I've been speaking with um, Mr. Davies about this, following some of the submissions, and we intend to look at if there are things he can do. But at the moment, um, council, as shareholder, asked that um, DVML would operate on a commercial basis, and so when they are booking out the town hall and the associated facilities to conferences that bring in people who spend three nights here potentially and there's a whole lot of economic benefit to the city, that to them um, meets the criteria that we have asked them to operate under as, as council, as opposed to holding a venue for two hours for a performing arts um, function. So that, that's what he has to weigh things up on. So that's why there's a degree of disquiet, because there's a tension between those two competing yeah. aims. And so until, and I think Terry and I, oh, Mr Davies and I have been talking about whether or not it's time to have a conversation and bring it back to this body and his board about whether it, we need to rethink how um, DVML runs. But in the meantime, he is clearly asked to um, make a commercial return and that's what he does. Councillor Venevis. I've sent a uh, proposed alternative motion, alternative to number two, to Lauren, and would like the opportunity to speak to it when questions. We can get to it in due course. I'm, I'm happy to note that, and we'll take questions as as they come, and then get to it. All good. Are there further questions, Councillor O'Malley? Um, as it relates to options one, two, and three. I think it's been traversed, but I just want to clarify it. If we were to go to option three and a decision was made by December, would that obviate us moving with option one or two later if they were the ones that we chose by December? No, no, it would not. You might, you might need to explain that. What obviate means? It means that we couldn't do it. Um. <laughs> Councillor Vandivis. Oh, we'll, we'll get it up and then we'll see if there's a seconder and then we'll okay. take it from there. If I could just clarify while we're waiting, the 28th of May 2019, Councillor, was the meeting it went to, so the charcoal blue um, went in 28th of May, sorry, so it was a, a, a typo, and it was in public. Seconded by Councillor Reddick. Thank Councilor you. I would, I would like to propose a, a variation to option two, and the reason I'd like to propose the variation is that um, I'm not convinced that the really big spend on the May Fair is A, necessary, or B, would uh, facilitate the continued use of the May Fair Theatre. Um, I've worked in theatres most of my professional life, providing both sound and lighting equipment, and have provided sound equipment as the South Island agent for theatre light to every theatre in the city. If we look at the Mayfair first, it already is a working theatre. The adjoining land, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the, the building itself, the theatre itself, uh, the adjoining building uh, and the land under it are already owned and being able to be gifted to us. So we are looking really at a gift horse here. A uh, whole theatre with adjoining buildings and the land under it all available for free for development. 
The Mayfair has good parking and access options for equipment and for sets. I spent decades moving large quantities of gear in and out of theatres. Um, the Athenaeum, to me, would be a nightmare requiring a lift. You can't get sets into a lift. If we look at the Athenaeum by contrast, it's a crumbling shell. It, uh, the building and the land under it are not owned by the DCC. It has poor parking and access options for equipment and for sets. Getting back to the Mayfair again, it already works and gets regular use as a functioning theatre. It does need uh, wheelchair access, it does need sig significant spending to bring it up to a level where professional touring theatre groups could use it, but it can be used in the meantime. And whatever we do, it will be some years before we have something that professional theatre groups can use. My suggestion is that we look at a much more limited budget over the next 10 years of $15 million. See what we can do for that, given all the advantages that the Mayfair site has. And if down the track we find that there is more money required to get a lot of travelling theatre groups through because of facilities they require, we could look at that then. This option gives us short-term utility. It, uh, it preserves the heritage Mayfair Theatre, gives us continuity, and I believe long-term gives us the best possible outcome for theatre and music use because it has the larger land footprint. So I urge you all to vote for this modified uh, option too, recognising that it does have some shortcomings, but that it has all the positives that I've listed just now. Further speakers? Councillor Reddick. Yes, I agree with this motion. Uh, I think you know the, this overall uh, charcoal blue series of reports have lined us up with a huge amount of spending, and very high operational costs, and a very low rate, very low viability for the theatre practitioners to recover any of those costs. Thus. It, to me, it's saddling the ratepayers with a very high cost into the future. Whereas we look at the Regent Theatre, uh, on what we've heard so far, and Carolyn may come up with something different, but only 200000 a year is the net cost to the ratepayers of having the Regent Theatre. And because of the economy of scale and because there's a large community support around that, I think putting a, another facility in competition with those community of supporters for the Regent uh, will point up its demise and make it very difficult to run. Not only that, the uh, extra one and a half million dollars a year in rent um, means it's, it's a much more expensive uh, venue to run and not only that, if we were to decide to take it over, uh, who knows what price it would be uh, for sale at. There has been, well, and as the heritage capital of New Zealand, we are somewhat beholden to work firstly with the heritage site of the Mayfair Theatre. It also has the proximity, of south, proximity to the South Dunedin hub and the studio spaces that that will provide, which are not mentioned in the Charcoal Blue Report other than to say they would like to have proximity to <coughs> studio spaces. And so it has that additional advantage. It's very close to the studio spaces, training and practice sites, uh, training and practice facilities that the South Dunedin Hub will provide. Similarly, having rejuvenating the Mayfair Theatre will contribute to the rejuvenation of South Dunedin shopping area, which I also think is a valuable uh, feather in its cap. And as mentioned before with the Regent Theatre, 
the Mayfair also has community support, and by that I mean it has got a group of volunteers who work hard to ensure its ongoing viability. And to my knowledge, they do not come cap in hand to the council on an annual basis looking for large grants and increases of grants. They themselves have been engaged with insufficiently if they are coming to us at the 10-year plan and making an alternate submission to what we are proposing. So that speaks a very large warning bell to me. So I think uh, this is a very good proposal and will save the council a lot of money, but it ensure the viability of the theatre ongoing with an established group of theatre practitioners. It's all very well for Charcoal Blue to make <coughs> suggestions of spending many more tens of millions, but they won't be the ones here volunteering and attending the performances and funding the viability, the ongoing viability of the theatre. And I think it's uh, beholden on us and a very good option to work with the people who are already um, <clears throat> holding a, a, a strong stake in that theatre and work with them to ensure its viability. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to speak to this briefly. I can't support this, um, and should it fail, uh, I'll foreshadow that I will move option three. Um, and I can't support it for two reasons. Firstly, um, as far as I'm aware, I, I can't understand the basis for arriving at a figure of $15 million or what that work would cost, or indeed whether it was capital or operating costs uh, that we're being asked to fund. But the real reason um, that I, I, the substantive reason I can't support this uh, is the same reason that I, I wouldn't have supported at this point someone putting up a proposal to confirm the Athenaeum as a site, and that is because uh, I think there's been insufficient, an insufficient window through no fault of, just through process really, uh, to put the, the proposal in its latest iteration through the charcoal blue work uh, for feedback from the people who are most likely to be using that. It appeared on the agenda for this meeting. It wasn't public information through the consultation period which would have allowed uh, informed feedback on that particular uh, iteration of this work. Uh, and um, as we've learnt, uh, Option three, giving us the opportunity to, between now and the annual plan process, uh, re-engage around these proposals wouldn't obviate uh, either of the, the either the preferred or the alternative option that we went out for feedback on. And and I'd, I'd further note, and it's you know we're always learning, and I think it was perhaps a missed opportunity that we didn't, um, on the myriad uh, public engagements and targeted stakeholder. Uh, meetings that we organised and getting feedback on the 10-year plan that we didn't organise one for our, our creative community and for our arts and culture community. And that's on us uh, collectively because I don't remember anyone raising it either. Uh, and that's um, certainly something that, um, that we can learn from. But I cannot see the, given the, the breadth of opinion that we have heard through feedback uh, from our creative community in particular, uh, I can't see the merit in, in rushing to make a decision today uh, that I don't believe um, would further delay the eventual work being done. Uh, and we're not talking years here, it's a, a question of, of months uh, to be able to take the work that is now in the public domain uh, for feedback from the most affected parties uh, and, and use that to inform uh, a decision that we would make in time for the uh, the annual plan, and if that means that some of the work streams, as has been mentioned, around governance models or detailed design or whatever, have to happen concurrently to some degree, and, and, and we've heard that that could that is doable. Uh, I think that's going to get us to um, a better place. This is a significant decision about a uh, what will be a significant civic asset, regardless of how it ends up being owned or operated, and, and I think it's worth. Uh, taking, and it's, uh, this is a conversation that stretches back decades already, I'm aware of that, but that's not the only significant decision about our city centre that we've prevaricated on for decades. Um, but I, I think it's certainly worth taking slightly more time than we have allowed it uh, and give us the better chance of, of getting it right. So I'll vote against this uh, and foreshadowing, um, and I'll move uh, option three. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I'll be, <clears throat> I'll be voting against this, and the reason for that is probably best summed up um, by the email that I got this morning. I chair the Creative Dunedin Partnership, 
and through uh, that avenue last week, I got a very clear message from all of the creatives um, that while they may not all agree on, on which option and whatever we choose won't satisfy everybody, um, they just wanted us to get on with it and make a decision. However, I can live with a slight delay. But the email I got this morning was from South State, uh, uh, Stage South, who've been involved in the process all along. And it says things like um, the Athenaeum uh, concept drawings and plan we're excited about. It's a, a good size, all the Dunedin theatre community's ever asked for. It's got a flexible space, has excellent potential, and it welcomes more than a European-style theatre. It should satisfy most touring shows. So for the theatre community, um, and might I suggest the wider performing arts community, um, there's a really clear message, but as the um, Mayor has said, just because uh, the process um, was out of sync for really good reasons. Um, they haven't had the opportunity to communicate that to uh, us more widely um, and, and haven't had the chance in numbers to communicate that message. Um, <clears throat> as for a couple of uh, comments that Councillor Raddick made, I just want to say very clearly that the Regent Theatre Management said in the Creative Dunedin Partnership meeting last week that they welcomed the Athenaeum option rather than the Mayfair and it was no problem for them in terms of the viability of their theatre. So uh, that was a very clear statement from the Regent. Um, and as for the Mayfair, I recall the Mayfair coming to us on a numerous occasions asking for grants. Um, I don't describe it as cap in hand but um, they have been to us most certainly. So I just wanted to correct those two points of fact. Um, and I just wanted to also uh, talk about, um, just mention the rent to buy option, which we'll get to, I guess, if, if this fails. Um, new, um, mention is made on page 92 around smaller music gigs, and I think we're really clear that whatever we choose won't necessarily satisfy the, the music community, um, but this, the scope of this report was not around that. So um, I will be uh, voting against this. I think we need to go back to the performing arts community and hear from them really clearly when they have an opportunity now to process the information in the phase three report. However, because uh, I may not have an opportunity to speak again, I do just want to take this opportunity to thank most sincerely both Mr Pickford and Ms Patterson, but particularly uh, Ms Patterson, uh, because today is her last day with us. She's been with us for nearly 20 years, long before I was on council. I interacted with Cara on matters uh, of the arts, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge the work that she's put into this, the work that she has done with Aratoya and prior to the Aratoya strategy, uh, in advocating for the arts community, uh, but within council, and she goes on to advocate uh, with another organisation, Creative New Zealand. We will see her again. She's in a different waka. Um, and we thank you for your service to this organisation, Cara, for all you have done to fly the flag for the arts over many, many years. Councillor O'Malley, I'm just going to speak to this motion because I'll speak. Um, I think Councillor Vandervis's motion actually is the reason that I'm going to vote against it and go to option three, and that is that there are lots of ideas out there of what we should do and we need to engage them properly. So I hear everything you've said, Councillor Vandervis, and I think that in order to allow everybody to have their say, we need to move to option three. Sorry, Councillor Houlihan. Um, yes, I... Um, Thank you for your motion, Councillor Vandervis. I, I would love to see this old theatre done up, but I'd also love to see a theatre in the Athenaeum. And um, I would also love to see a really good band venue like Sammy's up and running as well. So, I mean, I'm a lover of the arts, as everyone knows, but we haven't got the budget to do it all. So, at the end of the day, um, I, I have to agree, I think, to go back and re-engage with the promoting arts sector is needed here because I heard, I think all of us did, we couldn't miss it, 
the concerns raised by the band sector, by the theatre fraternity that said that they haven't had a, a home, a place to call home and hold theatre in since the fortune closed down. The band, um, uh, people in the band industry haven't, not only don't they have a venue, but they're really desperate for um, areas to to practice, and I mean, in, in showing my age here, but in my day, we used to go to Vogel Street, and they had the old build. Well, you know, old buildings. You'd go in, you'd climb through a window or something, and get in and bring all the gear, and we'd, you know, have gigs and practice for bands sessions. Um, and there used to be the pits that was in Bond Street. I don't know what either, whatever happened to that, but anyway. Um, so, you know, but there was there were places, and they people got quite creative in the areas that they found to play their music, do their art. And that is happening now without a venue, because definitely if you go to any of the fringe events and stuff like that, you, I had to crawl through some sort of thing in the floor to get into one venue. But So there is really a lot of people thinking outside the square. However, um, I do believe, I, I, my preference will be the Athenaeum, but I think the council needs to own it. And that puts us in a bit of a tricky situation when it's owned privately. We've just said that publicly, and what's that going to do, the cost and all those things. And I have got a real serious concern about ongoing costs that are going to be higher than what the fortune was, and the fortune couldn't succeed with those costs previously. So we have to ask, how is that going to work? Um, Mr Pickford talked about some of the ways around that, and I think... Um, you know, we need to have the arts sector on board to, to say we're going to pick this up, we're going to go for sponsorship, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Without the arts sector with us on this journey, we can't move on any of these, I don't believe. And so while I'd love all three, we need to make some decisions here. I'd love to see us be able to put the prices down a bit. Uh, on some of these builds so that we could see Sammy's back to its glory days. I mean, Shivers, I've seen some amazing bands there that many of you would have seen as well. Um, Straight Jacket Fits, for one, was a fabulous night. But, you know, we, we have to, um, you know, I think we need to engage. I have personally never seen the arc sector so disenfranchised as they are now. And I don't want to see this. What's happening at the moment, we've got the theatre fraternity and the band fraternity tipping at each other over a venue. That wasn't the intention. We've gone out here to do a good thing and it doesn't, it shouldn't bring people apart, it should pull them together. So I hope we can come to a solution that will do that. Um, and uh, Councillor Gary beat me at the post, but I wanted to say exactly that. Cara Patterson has been around for years, and I can remember when I... I mean, she still looks amazingly young, so don't worry, but I can remember doing arts things years ago as well, like Councillor Gary said, and talking to Cara and to um, Anthony Deca, so the two of them have been around for years. But whenever I go to functions with the arts, the arts sector people all say, oh, Cara talks to us all the time. We've got, you know, Cara's been great. There's not a bad word I've heard about her. So I, I think, sadly, she will leave a big gap for the council in our arts, um, in what we offer in the arts, but hopefully we can get someone amazing to fill her shoes. But they are big shoes to fill. And I actually suggest we might need two people to do the job of her because she's been run rugged <laughs> and has been extremely busy in doing the job probably of two people. But... Thank you, Kari. You're amazing. Sometimes it's easy just to give latitude, Councillor. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be much briefer and I'll focus actually what's in front of us and what's in front of us. Um, I'm sure the motion was uh, put in good faith by, um, by the mover. But I just wrote down two things immediately when I saw it on the screen. What is the data, evidence, and rationale for the $15 million? Um, secondly, three charcoal blue reports backed by industry people who know what they're talking about, by specialists. And th in front of us here, we have nothing other than, than the insurances of the mover. Um, as a couple of people pointed out, there was rightly or wrongly perceived lack of transparency. Uh, that is part of the 10-year plan consultation. Certain options were excluded, included or excluded that may have uh, led to us making uh, a more informed decision. Backing this just adds <coughs> to that story. 
And if this fails, I am happy to second the Mayor's foreshadowed option. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. Much to my regret, I'm unable to support this. I think it's too early to um, settle on an option. I'll be supporting option three. We really need to find a sensible solution to the performing arts ecosystem in Dunedin and analyse the needs of the sector. When I, because I wasn't here when the first decisions were made, when I went back to the Charcoal Blue report, number one, I looked at the appendix about all of the consultation, and then I looked at the outcome and says theatre. And I didn't pick that up actually from the consultation. And when we look at the actual charcoal blue report in front of us, it says um, this will not be achieved by renovating the Athenaeum alone. There are a range of scenarios which need to be considered. We actually do need to kind of go back to the drawing board about it. Therefore, I will be supporting, not supporting this option, and supporting option three. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. I was um, all in favour of um, moving this along, and I actually applaud uh, the motion from Councillor Vandervis. Uh, but what sort of stopped me in my tracks a little bit was when I asked a question of um, Mr Pickford, and he talked about the potential and um, asp or steps in, uh, about a potential pop-up space. And I really look forward to hearing more about that, because that basically enthuses me that something is going to happen a little bit quicker than what we've been looking at in our um, papers. The key thing that I've looked at all the way through is that, and what I liked about this motion was it started to get the ball moving on something. And I understand the budgets and where the timing of the reports were and when we were supposed to be looking at doing whatever theatre space. But we do need to um, continue a thriving theatre and music community. It is important to the city. The key part for me is we have an emerging film and television production industry, plus code. And when you bring in the gaming industry, they all work very strongly with vibrant theatre and music industry players. And I think when you look at our whole theatre ecosystem in the city, the key thing is we've got to get that community working together. We've got to get it happening now. We can't let this be a wedge between them all and have a, have a basic fight over a lot of who's going to have what. To me, it is a case of let's get stuff happening. And again, I was all keen to support this until Mr Pickford started talking about a pop-up space. Let's have the theatre and music industry working strongly. I know my son will kick me if I didn't support the music industry the way he does, and he really wants to see some of these gigs come to town which are bi currently bypassing us. Councillor Elder. I too liked um, this um, motion. I think um, South Dunedin is an up-and-coming place with the South Dunedin Library and Hub. But again, I, I go back and I go I think really we've got to re-engage with the performing arts stakeholders because in fact they didn't have the opportunity to have a really good look at the Athenaeum as well and I like that um, venue as well. I mean um, I also like Sammy's so but we have to choose um, at, at one. We have to choose one. We can't fund them all and so I think we have to go back to the community and so I'll support this as part of that conversation. Um, because it is a bigger conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I can't support this resolution, um, and that's not because I don't think it warrants consideration. As other speakers have said, I think we don't quite understand, and I think that stems from perhaps setting the, consult the, the concept of what we were trying to achieve slightly narrow, which focused Charcoal Blue on what we had asked for, which was for a theatre, performing arts theatre. And therefore, part of the arts community, have, as they've seen this proposal, have felt left out. So while well, I accept that probably a performing arts venue theatre um, may not be ideal for the music um, bands and others, I think there needs to be the ability to have that discussion. Um, 
and understand their needs as well. And while that may not solve our problem, <laughs> it may mean that we still have to have two venues, at least we will have included them in the conversation and we will have a better understanding of their needs and what we might need to do in terms of future options. So I certainly, you know, looking at the, the feedback we got through the long-term plan, it was certainly not clear that we had one option which was well and truly supported. There is that evidence that there's a certain degree of uncertainty and therefore I will be supporting option three uh, so that we can at least cover that off before we make a final decision. Councillor Lord. Yeah, we actually can support this. Um, the only figure that, uh, or not concerns me, the only thing we don't know is, is whether 15 million will do the job, but I have real concern we've got a theatre sitting in our city held by a trust that they are struggling to make it pay and to do what. I, I think the risk is it'll go the same way that the Fortune did, and um, I think I think the fact that we can take over a property that, that's been more or less offered to us at the at the hearings a couple of weeks ago, I think a fifteen dollar budget, fifteen million dollar budget is a very good start. And I think if in time, and I, I would suggest a sensible spend in the sense of I don't think you just start everything and fall short with a great big gap in it, but you might have to add to that in, in the next 10 years at some point, you might suddenly find it's 23, but if you look at the Athenaeum and the options there, the concern I have is that the vet current owner will have to spend $20 million and then we will spend 17 and a half for a fit out, there's 37. <laughs> and a half, and um, by the time he gets a return on his investment, I think there's a really good chance that it would just be getting up extremely expensive anyway, not far off the Sammy's price, so I just think this would be a sensible solution. I think it keeps a, a nice building and a nice place going, and so I'm supporting, I can support this. Thank you, Councillor Lofisor. Tēnākoe, Your Worship, I would just like to record my thanks to the mover and also um, say kakite anō to Kara. Um, I just, as other speakers have said, um, the, uh, I'm sure the intention of Council of Andavis is, is um, an awesome one. However, um, I'd just like to just quote briefly uh, a phrase I often hear from tangata whenua, mana whenua, nothing about us without us in the room. So this is why I would be supporting uh, option three, because we have dropped the ball as far as talking to the community most affected by this, and um, that's why I will be voting against this. Councillor Vernivis. There have been two objections to supporting this in general that I can see. One of them is the basis for the 15 million. If you look at the charcoal blue report and you look at what's required in all of these uh, proposals, you will realise that to get the wheelchair access and to get everything else, um, the earthquake strengthening, whatever, you are talking $10 million in any case. So there goes your first 10 million. In my long professional experience as the Theatre Light uh, dealer for the South Island, uh, I've supplied all the uh, lighting equipment, sound equipment and various other things to most theatres in this Otago and Southland. And uh, I have a very good idea of what $15 million will get. And I believe that it will get most of what would be required over the next 10 years. As Councillor Lord has said, there may be some extras required if we find uh, ground problems uh, for, for whatever reason for, for earthquake strengthening, it may go up. But at this stage, 15 million would be an extremely good start and a moderate uh, way of actually keeping uh, a well-used theatre running. We lost the fortune, we didn't have to. We're in f where we have the very real possibility that we will also lose the Mayfair unless we do something and do it soon. The other argument against is that we need to re-engage. 
re-engage immediately after the extensive feedback we have already got from the 10-year plan submissions, I don't believe that any amount of re-engagement will give us the <coughs> feedback that we have already got from theatre users, from local bands, from uh, local concerned uh, 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 punters that want to go to the theatre. I mean, Councillor Gary has made the point that the Athenaeum, you know, with its 37 million or I, whatever eye-watering millions it's going to cost, um, would satisfy most touring shows. Touring shows are outside events that show up a handful of times in a year here. I'm talking about our theatre and our people and our theatre practitioners and our band members, all of whom already use the Mayfair Theatre, most of whom have submitted to us already and love the theatre and want to keep it. And we're being given it on a plate. We need not to re-engage. Re-engage is just a fallback position for the massive eye-watering spend, and I think most of us know that. What we need to do is we need to show our support for the Mayfair. We need to keep it going, and we need to make sure that whatever theatre uh, 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 shows come to town are catered for either by the Mayfair or by the Regent. And we would own the land under both of them, we would own both buildings, and would, we would be in a position of actually making sure that theatres visiting and local theatre were well catered for. If we choose to re-engage now, we will simply stall. We will risk uh, the real opportunity that we now have with the Mayfair, and it will be a slap in the face of all of those people who have, over the 10-year plan submission process, come to us personally and in submissions and said, we want the Mayfair. Thank you. I'll put the motion by division. Councillor Barker? No. Councillor Benson Pope? No. Councillor Elder? No. Councillor Gary? No. Councillor Hall? Yes. Councillor Houlihan? No. Councillor Lafiso? No. Councillor Lord? Yes. Councillor O'Malley? No. Councillor Reddick? Yes. Councillor Staines? No. Councillor Vandivis? Yes. Councillor Walker? No. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? The uh, motion is lost. The votes against 11 4. 4. That doesn't make sense. But well, there's a tidier. Yes, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> um, thank you. The, as, as foreshadowed, uh, I've drafted something to give effect to option 3. I'm happy to second that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I won't reiterate the points uh, already made, but I think it certainly is helpful for the community at large for there to be a deadline on any period of further engagement. And I think doing this in advance of the of our next um, draft annual plan meeting uh, is a is a useful uh, deadline. I, I don't believe it will push out the eventual work, whatever that decision might be, uh, to any significant degree. Um, it, it cons I mean, I'm, I'm concerned by the suggestion that by voting against the previous motion the Mayfair Theatre is going to s disappear or cease to exist. Um, I, I don't, that's certainly not the, the tenor I got from their submissions either in writing or in person. There are certainly challenges with that building, um, but it will continue to um, 
service they use is for whom it currently works. Uh, but it, um, that's not everyone, uh, and that's. But I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to get into a debate necessarily about the, about these two options. All this is really uh, is is uh, asking for us to to take the work that was presented on the papers for this meeting, but wasn't made available for public feedback as part of the consultation process, uh, and 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 run that through the most um, uh, actively involved stakeholders in our community who would be the users of it, either on stage, backstage, front of house, in the auditorium, uh, wherever. Uh, and, and it would be um, remiss of us, I think, uh, to not spend, and it's not a huge, this isn't, you know, it's not a huge amount of time, just spending some more time uh, to check in with them on the work that they haven't had the opportunity to uh, give feedback on. Um, and I, I can't see how we could argue how you could argue uh, against um, more meaningful engagement uh, and consultation uh, on uh, options uh, to dis on, on potential uh, infrastructure as, as significant as this. Council of Andivers. We have spent an unprecedented $300,000 on investigating with charcoal blue. We have had feedback from all our local people, both rock and rollers, bands, theatre people, um, whoever, who pretty much reject the conclusions of the $300,000 report and have, through especially these latest 10-year plan submissions, told us that local users of theatre really prefer the Mayfair. Unlike the Athenaeum option, the Mayfair is operational and can be improved dramatically. Councillor, we're not debating um what the venue may end up being. Uh, that was a, a subject of the previous motion. This is a, a debate on a resolution to uh, include, the, include money in the budget and to undertake further community engagement. Your Worship, this is a resolution calling for further engagement. I am simply itemising the more than adequate engagement that we already have had and pointing out that we do not have any opportunity to get even better engagement than what we already have. We do not have, I believe, budget to have yet another $300,000 charcoal blue investigation. We do not have the opportunity before the year quoted to have another set of 10-year plan submissions come to us. We've had all that, is my point and that relates specifically to A. To ask for further engagement when we've already done everything that you could possibly hope for by way of an extraordinarily expensive report, consultants, and the 10-year plan process. We are now in the position of either making a decision or walking away. Any idea that further engagement is going to do anything other than muddy the waters and allow something extraordinarily expensive to happen is, I believe, foolhardy. We've had the engagement. We've had the $300,000 consultant's report. We have no excuse at all now for not deciding now. B, I can live with, although I think it's a bit on the hefty side, a, I certainly can't. That's fine. I'm happy to take the parts separately. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I can support these motions. I'm happy with both of them. Um, I, um, I agree with Councillor Vandivis and what he said about the charcoal blue report. I could not believe the price we paid for that report. I thought it was absolutely astronomical, and I agree with him again that I don't think we got the results we expected. I was really dismayed by many of the comments from the people, you know, the art sector people who came and talked to us during the hearings and who explained how they 
didn't realise what was happening, felt like they hadn't been heard. Um, they, they, there seemed to be some sort of, they thought they were pipping each other, you know, like that the a band sector were going against the theatre sector and, oh, it just sounded so um, torn up and disruptive and nothing seemed to be working or gelling well. But what we have is a sector that is still hurting, even though COVID hasn't hit New Zealand like it has other places around the world. It has hit our arts sector in many ways. And we a lot of, um, you know, theatre practitioners, um, mu musicians haven't been able to play for a long time. I mean, now things are certainly a lot freer, but um, it is, has been difficult. And some of them have talked about how the venues didn't even weren't even able to open the. Um, and, and also the fear that many people didn't want to come to gigs and now, of course, there's been the noise issue on top of that. So you can see there's high emotion around there and people are, as I said before, I've never seen the art sector so disenfranchised with what's happening at the moment and so highly emotive. So I, I feel it is the time, because we've heard that, and yes, we have engaged, but what we've heard is that they're not happy. And I think it would be rude of us to make an, a decision without going back to them and saying, we have heard, talk to us, what do you want? And I don't think, for me, I would not like to see us say, okay, we'll now take on to pay Charcoal Bloom to do more, God help us know. But what I'd like to see happen is that we can sit around and hear, um, you know, from some of these key art sector people and talk to them ourselves. Maybe have ca the whole council, have some of them come and talk to us at, over a couple of days or something. I don't know how we do it, but I think we need to let them come and just tell us what what they think. The, th the thing is, the cold reality is we can't satisfy everyone because we haven't got the budget for that. But if we can do it, great, let's try. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, just to recap, I will be supporting these two parts to the motion. Um, we chose, as a council, two options. Um, and we've never really been able to explain why we landed there, and part of that was the commercial sensitivity. And that's where the gap has been, and that's where the issue has been. In the meantime, uh, it was conflated with the music venue issues. And just putting that to one side for now, because um, the scope of this uh, Charcoal Blue report was, was never going to address, address that, um, in the way that the music, vent, the music uh, sector has very clearly explained what they need. Um, what we need to do is re-engage with the performing arts sector around the phase three report. And for reasons that were no one's fault, it's just the way it landed in terms of timing. When we received the phase three report, um, the, the, the tenure plan situation it needing to come to council first, um, they have not been able to process and feedback to us on that report. And in fact, any of that have processed it and read it and, and thought about it have reflected that in, in fact either or uh, of, the, of, the two, of the two options. Uh, they could make it work. Um, some have preferences one way or the other. They acknowledge that we'll never satisfy everybody. But, but it has been positive feedback. So what, <clears throat> what we need to do in our re-engagement is make sure that we get the feedback on the phase three report. And I think there'll be clarity in that. So I welcome that opportunity. Um, and I think this is a very uh, positive way forward. I particularly uh, appreciate the timing because I think what the sector doesn't want is for us to delay for too long, but long enough to re-engage with them and get their feedback on the phase three report. Thank you, Councillor Raddick. Uh, yes, uh, I can support both of these uh, elements of the motion. And I think a thing that we might see, I'd like to see come forward from the stakeholders in the Mayfair Theatre is a $17.1 million redevelopment option from them. Because I believe that they are, are 
probably capable of, based on the, what we've got in the charcoal poo reports and in the previous report that they commissioned themselves, uh, they have the ability to come up with a complete redevelopment option within the budget we see before us. In fact, that is the budget that they come up with in their earlier report, albeit 10 years old, but I believe a modification will be possible and they will be able to come up with something viable. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, um, and thank you for moving this motion, and thank you uh, to the staff for all your ongoing work in this sphere. It's really much appreciated. And again, I'll defer to um, something I've, I've done twice today, uh, the submitters who came and spoke to us and the submissions that were made through a very robust and very well-run 10-year plan process. It was clear to me from the many submissions that there is a clear desire within the arts community for a new performing arts center of around 350 people. It was also clear from the many submissions that it's a clear desire within the music fraternity for a music venue of about 600 to 700 people. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking to um, Councillor Van der Visser's motion, um, there is a perceived lack of transparency that as part of the 10 year plan process and consultation, that certain options were included or excluded that may have led to us making a more informed decision. I would like to therefore thank the many submitters who came to speak to us in a knowledgeable, intelligent and very constructive way. I really do thank them for that. It proves that banging, banging your fist on the table and being angry doesn't, doesn't really work but being constructive, sensible, and, 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 and forthright but knowledgeable does work. It also proves that the process that we're running here now, and we're often critiqued for, for following recommended motions and just towing the line, but it does prove that the system does work here, that if people, that we are amenable to shifting the way we think um, from the recommended options that are often put in front of us. That. And I think that, again, speaks to the constructive way in which the arts and music community did come to speak to us. The perfect win-win I see, down the road, wherever it may be, is a medium-sized theatre and Sammy's being converted back into the music venue that it deserves to be. How we get there, I know not. And hence the reason I support option three to re-engage with the performing arts sector and stakeholders. To quote Mr. Pickford from earlier, music and performance of a play can't be best served by just one venue. I'd agree, just acoustically alone. And from Ms. Patterson, lots of work to do and the project is a long way away. I'm not an expert. There are lots of experts in the arts and music community uh, sector in Dunedin and re-engaging with them seems like a logical and sensible way to go. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Wish. If I can support both option A and option B. When I look at um, A, I did say before that I didn't necessarily believe that the outcome aligned with the initial consultation. And I go back to the objective in the Charcoal Blue One report, which was to define Dunedin's unique performing arts ecosystem and what is required to make it thrive. And we see that we have 150 places approximately for performing arts in Dunedin. And I don't necessarily feel that this analysis has flowed through to be a mid-sized theatre. So I do um, question that when we look at our community, we're sort of about 50-50 on the need for a theatre. So I think we need to go back and define what is the problem and look at it in a holistic way. Um, we could also look perhaps at um, grants for access to the myriad of Dunedin's theatres, of which there are 150. There's the, um, the Playhouse Theatre, for example, the Mayfair Theatre, which needs work, and I think we actually need to go back and look at those in a holistic way. So I will support a placeholder for 17 million in the 10-year plan, given that it's more than three years out at the moment, um, and I also support option A. Councillor Elder. I support option A and B. It was clear that, that um, we needed to go back to the community and just reconsider this in the light of their feedback. I'm also thankful that Simon has <coughs> indicated that there is an interim pop-up um, measure in tow. So, um, yep, all good. I'll support both. 
for clarity, I'm not sure that's what Mr Pickford indicated at all, oh. beyond saying that there were there were options that could be progressed were oh. people of a mind to in, oh, the, I was in, very hopeful. in, in the interim, but <laughs> it's probably worth clarifying at this point. Councillor O'Malley. <laughs> you were, um, I'm going to vote yes to A, but I'm actually going to vote no to B because, because a lot of people from the music, live music community of part performing arts came back and said that these are incompatible venue types. And if we go to B, we've determined that in fact this will be a theatre, arts, spend only. And so we aren't going back to the full community in that regard. And I'm, the reason I would support going back to the community in general is I'm always reminded of Horses on Beaches, which is the Beaches and Reserve bylaw that went through. And we consulted significantly on a bylaw change. And it wasn't until we put the bylaw up that people realised what we were proposing. And then there were a lot who who had didn't engage or whatever for whatever reason, then realised and then wanted to engage. And I feel that we've got a very similar situation here. I think we haven't defined what performing arts means. So people have said it means me, and then we realised that we actually mean theatre arts. Um, if I look at the journey that happened in the looking at venues. When the fortune closed, the very first support we got was actually, let's go to Sammy's. And then the, I think at that point, there was a conflation of, if we can do theatre there, we can also take performing, we can take live music there as well. And then that never got clarified. And we've kept moving forward and we haven't clarified with all the community exactly what we're planning on doing here. Because if this had been a theatre only spend from the start, we wouldn't have had anybody from the live music group coming to us. So I'm worried that in fact, sections of the community still don't know what we define and what we were doing. And that worries me. And so, and I think that if we say it is for the future development of a mid-sized theatre, we are saying to the music community that that 17.1 will not be available for you, which is fine. We might want to say that. I just feel that, you know, we've got the 4.8 still, well, it was in the cons consultation budget. I hope it's still in the final budget for Sammy's. Um, and I guess, in some respects, the 22 whatever million that would have combined would have made a good discussion point for Part A. And that's the only reason I'm going to vote against Part B is not that I'm against the development of mid-sized theatre, but I'm actually worried that in doing Part B, we are actually saying that we will not be able to consult with the live music community, at least in the form of a venue. That's my main concern. No, I would just vote against it. I'll, I don't think I would win. I just basically think that it probably if it was just A, it would be easier. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley. I actually um, thought I'd said everything I was going to say in the, my last um, round. But um, Councillor O'Malley has just raised a very good point and that I will actually um, go with uh, that decision as well because when we we do get caught up sometimes in the detail of the motion and i think we have heard loud and clear from the music industry as well as the theater industry that they are two different projects and anybody you know 17.1 million is not going to be the budget it's going to be dramatically more and i think if we had had a little bit more openness in that part of the motion i would have been quite happy but it is, we do need to do the further engagement and go through that process. Thank you. To be clear from the beginning, I'm not proposing that we resource or outsource any of the further engagement work. I don't, I don't imagine that is something that requires that degree of impost. Uh, Councillor Vandervis has said, and I'm paraphrasing, that we've had all the feedback we're ever going to get, basically through the, the either the 10-year plan process uh, or through the various um, bits of work that Charcoal Blue have done for us, uh, and that as a result of all that work, um, we should make a commitment uh, to the Mayfair. Um, it certainly isn't the same sense I got from the submissions that we received either in writing or in person. A, a non-exhaustive list of what people uh, feel the community needs is a standing room music venue for five to 800 people, uh, a seated theater of both 100-ish or 350 to 400 people, an acoustic treatment that supports chamber music presentations or the work of the symphony orchestra and also touring rock and roll shows. And while a venue can be flexible and can be uh, modular, it cannot be everything 
to everyone. And I think, and I'm comfortable with, uh, with B being prescriptive in this way because I don't think we will ever uh, come up with a, a capital development that will satisfy both the needs of the mid-sized music industry, but the big end of the music industry is well catered for if you're in the 10,000 plus uh, size. It, it's, it's, the, um, it's something in that 500 to 800 range and, and I cannot ever see that being catered to by something that is also adequately uh, specced for, uh, for performing arts uh, as, as, or theatre as people may commonly understand or theatre and dance as people may commonly understand uh, that to be. It's become quite obvious um, through the submissions that there are more than one, there is more than one problem uh, in terms of how we support all levels uh, or all stages of our uh, arts ecosystem, which means that there will be more than one solution, and in some cases that's regulatory if you're dealing with uh, noise control or, or building app compliance, and, and in some cases it will be the provision of, uh, of venues or infrastructure that currently uh, doesn't, uh, that currently doesn't exist. Uh, and I think, um, I, I think people are right in that the, the, because the arts community aren't particularly used to uh, people offering them opportunities like this. And so what happens when you offer an opportunity like this is that people will are desperately trying to try to conflate all of these things because their general view, and it's you know history has shown us that another opportunity will be some ways off. So it is entirely understandable that people want us to create a single thing uh, that caters to all of those needs. I just cannot see that as being uh, possible and, and certainly would welcome um, further discussion and uh, it's happening whether we like it or not really with our music community about how their varied uh, needs at, at different stages of, of, of a, an artist's trajectory uh, can be catered for whether they're local or, 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 or touring acts and I will take both parts of this by division. Thank you. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson? Oh, Pat A. Yes, beg your pardon. George O, for me to read it. Pat A. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope? Aye. Councillor Elder? Aye. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Van der Vis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? Yes. Your Worship? No. Carried 14 to 1. B. B. <laughs> It was, it was more equine than it could have been, but focus people. <laughs> Decides that 17.1 million in the 10 year plan budget be retained for the future development of a mid sized theatre. Councillor Barker? No. Councillor Benson Pope? No. Councillor Elder? Yes. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lafiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? No. No. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Councillor Raddick? No. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandervis? No. Councillor Walker? No. Councillor Wiley? No. Your Worship? No. Sorry. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> the eyes have it. <laughs> yes, carried 9 6. I will move that we adjourn the meeting until quarter past three. Seconded, Councillor Staines. Thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That is agreed.
Mr Logie and Mr Christie. Welcome to page 198 of your uh, agenda, because of course we've passed over uh, shaping future Dunedin Transport, which we will deal with tomorrow. Anything by way of introduction from either of you gentlemen? No, we're happy to go straight to questions. So am I, thank you. Questions? Councillor Elder. In the report, it says initial um, report was out, uh, offered to the Otago Central Rail Trail for feasibility work on possible extensions to the Otago Central Rail Trail. I was just wondering uh, how that work is progressing because, in fact, we need a full report to make good decisions later in the year. Yeah, the Trust has met and are working through getting funding options and um, applying for funding to get the feasibility study done, which we've offered support for. So it's early stages, Councillor. Thank you. No questions? Would someone like to move? Councillor O'Malley? I'm just looking at the role of OETT in this relationship and things like with the Rails Trails Trust going forward and looking. Is OETT involved in that discussion at the same time or are they involved? Are they in the room? Um, no one's in the room yet, but I'd expect that they should be invited. Very good. And um, what's happening with regard to the long term structural relationship with the train and DCHL in general? Because this is, this is getting us through a short term period of time, but are we looking at anything structural coming through? So this, this is really a short term holding pattern, and which allows those discussions to occur. I would say is that um, the first resolution there, looking at the strategic and financial implications, those strategic ones um, involve, will involve uh, models of ownership alongside um, the strategic importance or otherwise to the city. Tanaka, your worship, Tanaka, thank you both. Um, uh, sort of. I don't know, I'll just ask the question. Um, I'm looking at option four and the bottom part that's not funded. Uh, I just said, well, it says uh, for 2021 slash 22, there's no option uh, for middle March due to the time that will be required to undertake maintenance requirements. So um, do we know what that time is? Yes, I understand that the maintenance is quite considerable to be able to run a chartered service on that line and could be up to nine months before they could operate it. Councillor Staines. Oh, something. Anything in particular? Yeah, all good, thank you. Um, I just have a, I have a question around the use of the Kiwi Rail line. Um, we're being asked to make a decision as to whether we use either our track or their track or a combination. Is that assu that's assuming that we are able to, or do we have that arrangement in place with them to be able to continue that? Uh, my understanding is that an arrangement is in place and under negotiation currently. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Then just Councillor Elder. Yeah. Uh, just, um, just related to the Kiwi Rail uh, line. Um, how much rental does it cost us? So I'll get that. Uh, we've literally this afternoon had a letter from Kiwi Rail um, during the course of these deliberations that have suggested they want to renegotiate that given um, the situation at Hillside because they must have increasing demands for their line space. Um, so that has arrived during the course of the meeting and we've not had a time to consider it yet. So it's likely that they'll want to increase our lease. I'm happy to move option one. Um, Sorry, Councillor O'Malley. Um, relevant to whether we move option one or option two, have you taken into account that if a line does not have movement on it, 
it actually requires higher maintenance when you go back to it again later so that if we decide not to run trains up the Tyree Gorge we could be facing a bigger maintenance bill in the future. Yes, my understanding is that DCHO have factored that into the figures that they've given to us. Um, there is a, a lesser requirement in year one to go to Hindon as a result of some of the maintenance being able to be deferred, uh, but the majority of it still has to be done even if you're not putting a train on the track. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. A question for the CEO. Can she expand upon what she has just informed us and or does that have an implication on, on any decision we are supposed to be making? No, so uh, the timeline is slightly different so it won't have um, an implication on the decision you're being asked to make today because it's a one year decision today. And then we will have time, um, DCHL uh, riding back to Kiwi Rail, and I'll provide an update once they've done that, but that's, that's the best I have, sorry. So, okay, so just for clarity, the communication you're, you and DCHL are having with Kiwi Rail right now does not apply to the financial year 2021 to 22. It does not, but it will um, feed into that broader strategic um, review. Okay, thank you. Councillor Barker. Just going through the differences between option one and option two. So option one is Kiwi Rail Network only for 2021-22 and option two is Kiwi Rail and Tyree Gorge to Hindon Network, that's correct? Yes, that's correct. And the difference in the options is mainly that option two allows for investment on the Tyree Gorge line and assets to Hinden. Yes, that's correct. And the other um, option is that the supplier is an additional shorter journey alternative on the Tyree Gorge line to Hinden for customers. Yes, that's correct. And then that um, the disadvantages... This is, I guess, not to council. There's an additional cost required for the maintenance on the track to Hinden, and I'm assuming that under the report that this will be covered by DCHL? Yes, that's my understanding. So that is not a cost directly to Council? That's correct. Okay, thank you. The recommended option has been moved by Councillor Staines and seconded by Councillor Elder. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Oh, my apologies. It's been moved by Councillor Staines, seconded Councillor Lord. Go for it. Yeah. The recommended option. Yeah. Thank you, Worship. Um, in, in moving option two, um, I think we get the best opportunity to continue to see how well a business can be run. The fact that the funding for that 12-month period is being covered by DCHL will bring a certain degree of focus uh, and I, my personal view is we will get a very good indication of the potential future for that line. Um, I think, you know, I, I did in the last debate note that once you stop using a railway line for any length of time, you lose your rolling stock, then it's gone for good. We're not, it's not going to come back. So I think in making this decision, it's a heritage asset of the city. I think we, we do have to maintain it in use until we are confident that either we can continue with it or that that asset is going to be lost for the long term. Councillor Barker. I support this option as well. It's been um, canvassed many times. There are very many reasons why we should support the Tyree Gorge Railway as a key tourism as um, asset, both for heritage, also for the return on investment and the economic impact of the city. So this, again, is a no-brainer. Councillor O'Malley. Um, it's good to see option two as the one that's going forward. Um, you, it's not just a matter of the rolling stock. The steel on the line needs to effectively be massaged by tons and tons of ro rolling stock going over it, otherwise it will start to warp. 
and the material underneath will start to displace and you'll end up with substantially higher maintenance costs later. But it gives the opportunity to the town of Middlemarch to get involved in economic development. I still am really strong on wanting to see a greater role of OETT in the general day-to-day -day strategic behaviour of the train because they have the significant knowledge on how to run this train and I think that maybe this year would be a good year to work out the model how much of a hybrid it is and in fact whether or not in fact OETT can learn enough then to extract the asset out of DCHL later. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah look I support this. I am um, I know that in this situation, running the train like this, it's never probably going to wipe its face completely. And the, the question always comes down to how much is this Dunedin City Council being prepared, or is how much are they prepared to put in for this? And if we are not prepared, it limits the Kiwi rail lines and nothing else. If we're not prepared to invest in the track, now I, I realise it's a um, it's a difficult thing. It's like some people don't want to invest in libraries or some people don't want to be invest in the arts or whatever, but I think as far as a tourist attraction goes, this has proven to be pretty worthwhile over the years. I think there's not many people in this room that probably haven't enjoyed a trip or two on it. And um, I think it's something that particularly is unique. Where, for example, the Kingston fire, flyer going from Kingston to Fairlight or whatever it was, it was on a wee bit of... It sort of went nowhere and you had to go somewhere to get there. You had to go a long way to get to it. It wasn't an easy bit. But this one here, close to a reasonably big city, it, it should be more sustainable. And I really do wonder, um, I suppose as a child I remember steam chain, trains running up and down. I remember several trains a day between Omer and Dunedin. I remember often travelling to Dunedin on the train. And, and as I sit down now, I think it's something that a lot of children will never do. And I think, I think this is worthwhile investing in at this stage. Councillor Vanavis. Councillor Staines has said that uh, by going for option two, throwing more money at it, um, it will give us a good indication of the potential future. We have had the railway for decades now. And in the decade pre-COVID, with 85% of the income coming from cruise ship passengers, we effectively lost $1.5 million every year running it, even with that extraordinary external cruise ship income. <coughs> so it wasn't a heritage asset then, it was already a heritage liability to the tune of $1.5 million a year. Now, without the cruise ship industry, and with no hope of the cruise ship industry returning in the foreseeable future, we don't need to spend a lot more money to realise that it's not a heritage asset. It has long been a liability, a liability with increasing compliance issues, with increasing health and safety issues so that the older carriages simply don't comply anymore, you can't use them. We have got a heritage liability here that we are simply failing to recognise as such. Failing to recognise a liability that's costing you more than a million dollars a year has been something that was forgivable in the past by this council because we weren't told of the $10 million maintenance deferral that was going on in the background. Oh, that was last year. It's now a $15 million maintenance deferral this year. Next year, it could be a $25 million maintenance deferral. The writing is as clear as it possibly can be. It's on the wall. There is no potential future for the Middle March line. 37 bridges with unaffordable maintenance issues mean we simply can't do it. Carriages that are too old and of a design that can't be um, uprated to meet new health and safety requirements mean that much of the rolling stock we have is also now redundant. The narrowness of the tunnels means that there are only certain types of engines and carriages that can go through them. All of these things point to 
no potential future for a liability that we are making ratepayers pay for by this motion here. I can't support this motion because I can't see how, having thrown a million dollars at mothballing and for 10 years having quietly deferred one and a half million dollars worth of maintenance every year, that we can justify throwing more good money after bad. I hope the rationale of the numbers will speak. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll be brief. Um, Councillor Mally, I'd love the, uh, the job title of Steel Masseuse. Wouldn't that be a, a good one to put on one CV? Um, I just want to say, if the, news around, the recent news around Hillside is anything to go by, uh, rail definitely has a future, and that's, um, and that's part of this city too. Um, and as Councillor Staines, I think, um, quite rightly pointed out, um, once we stop using this line, it's gone. It's, it, it's, it's not going to come back. It's gone forever. And also, Councillor Barker, I think you're, you're spot on by saying this is a key part of our tourist offerings. And, of course, it goes without saying, fundamental part of this great, uh, great little city's heritage. So I fully support the option in front of us. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm very supportive of this operation, have been um, since the get-go, uh, and I think the initiatives that have been taken to try and keep it rolling are entirely uh, sensible and logical. Uh, and we are all only too aware of the community response to the risk of, um, of losing part or all of the service and the, and the hardware. Um, and as has been commented earlier, people often uh, only get off their bikes and engage when, you know, when there is a, a crisis, I guess. And it's certainly true that the uh, operation has been severely affected by the cruise ships, but it was always um, marginal anyway. But there's no doubt about its importance to, as a tourist product for the city. I read the ODT this morning. Um, and there was comment on the front page about another item on our agenda um, claiming there was no report, no consultation, no public, f public comment telling us what the community wanted. Well, there sure has been on this issue, and I hate to think that we didn't support um, this operation because it would be awful if this turned out to be another facility that Dunedin might lose, and I quote, Councillor Elder. Um, I realise that the Tyree Gorge, Tyree Gorge Rail is an iconic attraction, but I want to open your minds to another option, and it's only talking about another option, it's opening our minds, and that is that 20,000 people this year completed the Otago Central Rail Trail, going on the figures that are here, and that is, in 2017, 13,000 completed. At 67% increase, that makes it up to about 20,000. And those 20,000 people would have voted with their saddles, <coughs> on their saddles, with their pedals, to take an iconic cycle trail down the Tyree Gorge. These people, on average, spend 260 a night. And yet these people aren't coming to Dunedin, they're turning it out, turning back at Hyde and going back to Clyde on the whole. So Middle March isn't seeing the full potential of the cycle trail. Soon, the cycle trail will start in Queenstown and end in Dunedin. That will bring a huge amount of people into the cycle trail network. And in fact, for Middlemarch and Dunedin, create more economic impact. But the biggest thing for me is, what do we want to invest in? And, and that is, for me, this, the Tyree Gorge is a, f a free opportunity for the whole community to enjoy the recreational asset that is the Tyree Gorge and the Tyree River. It's free for the whole community, whereas it, 
trains are exclusive. It's free to use 365 days of the year, whereas it's exclusive only to, to all but people who use the train. It creates a recreational trail that has a low gradient, making it accessible to those with a wide range of abilities and fitness. Creates an iconic recreational trail that is accessible to those on low incomes and creates equitable... Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Vanivis. Um, it's unclear to me which part is being spoken to also. If that's your point, I'm sorry. If I carry on. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how this relates to the recommended option. In front yeah, of I, I, that was the point I was trying to make. I, and I, I was waiting for it to circle back uh, to the resolution, and we didn't quite we didn't quite get there. I got carried so away. So I, I would I would ask I'll uphold the point of order for relevance, and I'd ask the councillor to focus on the uh, item at hand, not necessarily the one that she prepared to speak to. Well, I just believe that we should be open to more options than one, and so I I will not support um, option two. I would prefer to, as I foreshadowed, option one. So you're going to move. Should this fail, you're going to move that. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Further speakers, Councillor Wiley. Yeah, like. Like many, I am sort of have considered back and forth the importance of the Tyre Gorge to Hinden network. Um, and I've been I'm quite hesitant in some ways, um, based on the introduction we got from the CEO uh, and the comments that she made, I'm quite concerned on where we go to uh, with this. The part that I look at is I'm a full supporter of the train service. I think what's been happening, uh, travelling on the line north, has been uh, to Waitati has been a real positive, and positive for the community. And I think there's a real future in a train service. I struggle with the potential of again another season, um, Tyre Gorge line to Hindon, and whether that will have the impact. But one thing that actually did change my mind over the weekend was that MB have introduced a new fund, and it's basically the Regional Strategic Partnership Fund. And it's a, essentially a revamp of the Provincial um, Growth Fund. And I think there's some potential, and if we didn't go down this pathway of what's being moved, um, I think we are shutting ourselves off of getting any other potential funding through government to assist whatever happens going forward. And the only, that's the only way I'm actually putting the two and two together and hopefully getting four and not six um, is getting me to a situation where I can support this motion. But I do think there's got to be other ways to fund it going forward uh, because the serious amount of investment that is going to be needed cannot come from this council. Councillor Reddick. Yes, this is um, you know, an interesting thing because people love trains and we're here looking at this whole service and I agree with Councillor Vandivis, at the moment it looks like it's going to be an ongoing very large cost with no end in sight. And I also agree with Councillor Elder that converting that train track to a rail trail will produce definite community benefits. However, I don't believe that the uh, public of Dunedin can um, see both of those things yet. So I think it's a really good idea to run this trial uh, for another year, and or run this trial for a year. So in the hope that uh, DCHL can uh, fully explore the money-making capacity of the train without cruise ships, and to perhaps determine a brighter future for the train, because I'd love to have the train. Uh, However, it's a pretty good fallback position if it all, um, if it doesn't work out, we could go to the push bikes. Yeah. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a couple of things to say about this. I'll be supporting the motion. Um, and if we go back to when we needed to make a decision, was it really a year ago? Um, and we were faced with a really difficult task. Uh, I believe we had a lot of courage in the decision we made to put the train into hibernation. 
Um, <clears throat> and then we had the summer season. And one thing that I noted during the submissions to the 10-year plan, um, we had feedback from some people around various things that, you know, were we really going to listen to them? Well, I listened really carefully to the people who spoke about the train both then and, and during public forum at another point. And the message they gave us was really, really clear. And the added, added factor is the need for using the line, otherwise um, it deteriorates. Uh, so it seems like a no-brainer, really. Um, and it gives us options going into the future. And I particularly note in the advantages the, the point about giving um, time to understand the future of tourism, because we still don't know how that's going to look going forward. Um, we're, we're the vaccine's being rolled out across the world, it's being rolled out here, um, and, and there is uh, movement forward and back, and, and we don't know where that's quite going to land. So in the meantime, um, we have listened to our community and they have told us how much they value this asset, and this decision gives us the opportunity to still retain it going forward. So um, I urge colleagues to um, have courage and to support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Hulahan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I have, I'm a huge supporter of rail. Um, well, I'd like to be. My father used to work at Hillside years ago. And, um, uh, however, I do have concerns about the amount of money this could, um, <clears throat> could cost. I see we have an option here, but it doesn't say whether it relates to option two or not but where that um, is, it says here that to instruct DCHL to fund the 2021-22 costs through debt and or revenue resulting in no financial impact on DCC. Um, now, if that happened, that would obviously mean uh, no change in rates, I would imagine, with that. Um, but it adds cost to DCHL. We, um, yeah, I, I do have quite a few more questions and concerns about it, but because we're in speeches now, I can't ask the questions. So I am concerned about voting on something that I don't fully know the implications on. However, I do support keeping rail going, but I also support what Councillor Alder was saying around the cycleways, and I suppose that's while we're in these positions, we have to make the hard decisions at times when there's lots of things that could happen and there's lots of different options that would be very positive because, I mean, a cycleway connecting up with the Central Otago Rail Trail would be amazing and I think has potential to bring thousands of people to Dunedin. Not that I know where we'd sleep them, but they could come and eat here, sleep in their car perhaps, and, you know, eat at our restaurants. But... Uh, well, sleep on their bike, maybe. Some of these bikes are very flash these days. But, um, you know, I, I do think that our opportunities and the Tyree Gorge Rail Trail is one of the world's best rail trails and it would be a real shame to see it closed. So for that, for the time being, I will be voting in support of this because it is a world-class rail. You had us on tenterhooks, Councillor. Uh, further speakers? No, Councillor Staines, you're right to reply. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I have to accept that it's unlikely that we could operate the Tyree Gorge without some ratepayer funding. However, the last season indicated quite good business when you leave out repairs and maintenance of the track. And the CEO of DVML, whose job it was to run that trial, was quite positive about growing the business in the next season. I think it could be said that Dunedin Railways was perhaps captured by the cruise business. And there's been other tourism assets in this town that I think were captured as well. The cruise ships are chart charge their passengers very large prices and pay their providers very little. Having built up the asset to a point that they needed those passengers and yet got very little money off them, 
meant that they were locked in that loop. It's like supplying a supermarket. Eventually, the supermarket could kill you because the pr you, they, you, so much of your business is dependent on them that you cannot say no when they say they're not going to give you any more money. And so I think the next 12 months, we need to do a few things, one of which is see how expanding the product range might uh, help the profitability of the business. Secondly, get a better idea if cruise comes back, what actually it might, what kind of form it might make. I suspect that the big cruise ships won't come back here for quite some time, but we, we may well see the smaller, if you like, adventure cruise ships coming through, and that might, that typically has passengers of high value, uh, so there may well be room for products that will generate much more income off less people. There's the comment been made around converting it to a rail trail. And I think we need to remember that a rail trail through that country, firstly, there are areas of it that are, are far from safe, and there will be significant funds. I, I, I could imagine quite a lot of people will get to the viaduct and not want to ride a bike across it. Um, so there will be a lot of funding required to convert it to a cycle trail, and the maintenance won't entirely go away. I accept that it will be less than it will be to have a locomotive passing over it, but remember, we don't charge for our, rail, our, our cycle trails, um, and there will need to be funding to keep it open. You could argue that there's economic benefits that will stem from those that ride the trail, but you could also use the argument there's economic benefit from those who ride the train. So I think there are questions we still need to answer to be sure. I think we need to ask our community how much they value that asset and how much they are prepared to put towards it. And we did not do that through the long-term plan consult consultation. We weren't ready. I would hope that this gives us enough data that it can be scheduled into an annual plan to ask our community how much they're prepared to support it, and by then we'll know what structure we're going to need uh, for any future running of the operation. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? We'll take it by division. Councillor Barker? Aye. Councillor Benson Poe? Aye. Councillor Elder? No. Councillor Gary? Aye. Councillor Hall? Aye. Councillor Houlihan? Aye. Councillor Lefiso? Aye. Councillor Lord? Aye. Councillor O'Malley? Aye. Councillor Raddick? Aye. Councillor Staines? Aye. Councillor Vandivis? No. Councillor Walker? Aye. Councillor Wiley? Yes. Your Worship? Carried 13 to 2. Thank you. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for five minutes, second of Councillor Gary, and we'll be back uh, to do item 13. Lucky for some, or as far through that item as we can. Those in favour? Feels good there. <laughs> aye.
Item 13, the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame update from Mr Pickford. Welcome. Comments from you, Ms Graham, by way of introduction. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, since this report was written, um, we've taken some further advice because the question was asked, um, what did it mean if we were potentially um, taking on a new um, cultural facility and did that affect levels of service? I've received that advice um, this morning. And so in discussion with the Mayor, um, we think it's probably useful that I circulate that for councillors' advice so they can see it um, overnight. So that, and then, so that that means that um, recommendation A, the decision on the expression of interest, um, needs to be delayed until you've had time to consider that advice, because it will provide some clarity. You don't want to paraphrase what the advice is. I can paraphrase what the advice is because this decision. Um, potentially involves a change of level of service and it's outside the cycle of the long-term plan and didn't form part of the consultation document, we do need to consider um, the process we might use to seek community feedback on this. Per, this, per our own significance and engagement yep. policy? Yep, because it's a change level of service. The, um, the funding were council of a mind to fund it, regardless of whether you think the 650 is the right figure, but any figure up to that doesn't trigger significance, or even even more than that, because our overall operating budgets are 350 million. So the it's not the the quantum of the funds; it's the taking on a new level of service potentially that we need to consider. And we haven't had time to fully review the um, legal advice. So, In which I'm, I'm I'm happy to take questions, but I'm also keen for people to have the opportunity to read that in advance of making uh, a decision. So it's going to, it's my intention once we get to questions insofar as they can be answered at this point to, to adjourn the meeting and pick this up tomorrow. Um, the next day maybe because this is the only operational request for funding as well. Well, or, well indeed, uh, and, or, or consider it along with the, the funding requests and paper um, which would let us get on with the capital works, um, the infrastructure papers. Uh, tomorrow, yeah, and then consider this alongside the the various funding um, requests. Um, I'm just, you know, it will be. I don't want people to have to rush their way through legal advice, um, and if and we can get that um, circulated overnight. But sorry, uh, questions, Councillor Fanavers and Councillor Benson Pope. Um, I'm very happy to get the legal advice overnight. Is it also possible to get advice of the breakdown of the claimed $628,000 annual operating advice that we've been given? I can recirculate the previous report which has that detail. Um, I'm talking about proper detail of the $628,000. So, Councillor, that has the, the previous report has that um, broken down by, um, for example, staffing and marketing and so on? We have the figures that's for you to decide whether you think that they are adequate or not for the um, running of the service. Thank you. Further, I'd point out that the, the standing resolution of Council is that we would defer making a decision on this until... No, I haven't done that. <laughs> I'll move. I'll move that we extend the length of the meeting beyond six hours. It, it, it seemed. It's. It seemed implicit. Second, Councillor Gary. All those in favour. Those against. Uh, but as, as pointed out in the in the papers, the decision that Council's taken previously is that we would defer making a uh, a, a final decision until the RSL review process um, has been completed, and it currently isn't at this point. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. Was there any further information about the reference to a suggestion that Mr Edgar might be making a further contribution of some kind? We have no information where about did that, that. Where did that come from? You would need to check with the Daily, Daily Times. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. 
Oh, with regards to that, I'm not sure whether you can answer that or not, but um, if we were to put it at, uh, if we approved it and then if we decided to put it at the Edgar Centre, if there was funding there from Ian Edgar, um, I mean, it would mean an extension to the building, I think. I mean, have we got any idea what sort of costs we'd be looking at there? No, no, we don't. We haven't, no. we haven't looked at that. And also the stability issues with the building at the moment. So, and, and, and nor can we actually, nor can we make a decision to send it there. The, there would be an expression of interest process where we would, yeah, and, and where we would have to. Um, but I did through. provise that saying if any of this happened. I'm just trying to find out because it has been in the paper today, and you know, as you raised it, I'm just. But I have got some other questions. Is that. Um, given the parking at um, the Edgar Centre, um, do you see that being oh, an okay. issue? Oh, okay. So, we'll, I'm, I'm taking. I'll take questions on the advice that has been given, and then we need to find a way forward before we move into you're moving on to questions of the the report itself, which we may or may not get to. Councillor Barker. Hmm, not sure if this re relates to the overview of the report. I'm just wondering what um, engagement there's been with the New Zealand Sports Hall of Fame board since the um, since January. So there's been conversations with the board at a high level around their process, which obviously, you know, to be clear, um, which is their process, um, funded by Sports New Zealand. So um, it, they've just been high-level discussions. We're just keeping in touch. Um, and obviously they had a copy of this report um, and they're, they're comfortable with, with as it's written but obviously without the advice that the Chief Executive has um, just talked about. Councillor Fissel. Tēnā your Worship, tēnā koe, Mr Pickford. Um, forgive me, aroha mai, for my lack of concentration over the, the various times that this has been discussed. Uh, is, is it clear, has it been made clear to us that they're not interested in moving it out of the city? So the, the, the report that came um, to council back in January talked about um, that they had commissioned this piece of work, the Sports Hall of Fame had commissioned this piece of work to look at options for their future. Um, and they have, that piece of work was done, done by RSL and has continued on, but they haven't, um, as they thought, they hadn't reached a point when they said, right, okay, this is where it belongs, this is where it... Um, they've approached a few uh, possible sites, but nothing has been decided, so that's hence the EOI process. Councillor Barker. Just going back to the report, I'm just a little confused around, on page 209, option two, do not provide interim support for 2021-22. Is... Then a misspelling, it says disadvantages, the Sports Hall of Fame would remain in Dunedin as a visitor attraction? Is... I would suggest that's a, a typo. <laughs> but in, in its defence, they do all seem correctly spelled. <laughs> it's just missing, okay. missing the word. Yeah. <laughs> would not. Would not, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Could you clarify... If, as a council, we said, oh, we like this location, who decides where it would go? So the first question is whether, as a city, we want it. And so that's what the EOI process would be, not necessarily where in the city. And then it will, we would have to, if that were the decision of this body, we would have to look at where it could be. And so that would be part of the EOI process, which would require some consultation, which is the part of that process that we um, have taken advice on. What's EOI? Expression of interest. All oh, right. OK. So if we express an interest and then we have to be chosen as the chosen city, do we? So we, they might not even choose us. Correct. But until oh, RSL, and that's part of the point, but RSL haven't <coughs> finalised that report, and so we're still waiting for that. And so we're lacking a little bit of information about what that means. It was meant to have been completed oh. in advance of this meeting, but it hasn't been. We're lacking a lot of information, really, aren't we? Oh dear. OK, thank you. Councillor Raddick. Um, Mr Pickford, has there been any exploratory work or investigations or thoughts or reports or anything to do with what the Sports Hall of Fame 
could possibly be in a, you know, some future rendition. So I'd refer you to the, um, the only work that's being done is that attachment, I think, that's linked in here, but was attached to the 27th of January report, uh, which was the... Um, Manueva. Manueva report, which does talk about, um, obviously, the, the level of interactivity uh, that's expected of a modern museum, the care of the collection, um, the governance, all, all of those things that they highlighted as issues. So that's the only envisaging of what it could be, but no serious piece of work's been done about what it could look like um, in any great detail other than highlighting the issues. And that process would be presumably the expressions of interest process yeah, where correct. people put forward ideas for what it could be. Correct. And at this, and at this point the advice is that we can't make a decision about whether to pursue that or not because it is of such significance that it requires direct consultation with our wider community. That's correct. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Oh, this is a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> to say the least. Um, has there been, and I, I, I suppose it's talk, call, talking about expression of interest from any of our facilities to take up the sports museum as part of their very own? So the expression of interest is... is expressing would be to express the council's interest in taking over the running of it so as the chief says it's just where that might be whether it's in its current site in the railway station or somewhere else um, would be part of that work uh, just, but it, yeah, just to jump the expression of interest that RSL are talking about is from any city or town around New Zealand yep. who might want to express an interest to have the hall not yep. about us necessarily express or our institutions expressing oh, interest. I was trying to be tongue in cheek there because I was asking if any of our facilities had wanted to put their hand up for such a thing, for, for owning such a thing. No, did, that, we did that, was, did. that was droll to an extraordinary degree, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> well, it's getting towards the end of the day. Well, yeah, Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. So, to clarify, it sounds like we have to first of all decide as a council whether we want to express an, uh, express interest to and then from there we have to get together a pitch either in a document or presentation to present to the to the New Zealand's board or whoever it is is that the case almost so not quite not right. quite <laughs> and that's why if and what our advice says is were council to want to take on an additional cultural facility, um, it's an increased level of service, and so then we would need to consider how we consulted on that potentially. And because right. it's out of cycle with the long-term plan, we need to think about that. So if, we don't, if council were of a mind to put in an expression of interest, then we would need to um, work out how we did that. Right, I've got a suggestion. I know he's not a New Zealander, but could we put forward that if Dunedin put forward an interest, we could say that Roger Federer could come here, have the key to our city, and open this lovely event? I say this as a huge Roger Federer fan. I'm more of a Nadal man, but... Um, Agreed. Uh, look, I think the, the, the key point here is that the, advo the advice that staff have received is that we can't make a decision about whether or not we want to pursue this without asking for direct feedback on that. Uh, I'm seeing the meeting descend into something. I'm not entirely sure what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, think I'm, I think it's going to be easier to deal with uh, the, the funding part of this in the round as part of the funding requests paper when we get to that. Uh, the advice will be circulated overnight and if people have any um, objections based on receiving and processing that to the to the way that we're handling it, then we can, we can deal with that as the meeting um, progresses. But that's, um, this feels like a natural pause of proceedings. I'm going to move that we adjourn the meeting until 9.30 tomorrow morning, second at Councillor Walker, uh, to, in, in order to um, have staff available to talk to the substantive papers we have before us, uh, as much as talking amongst ourselves for half an hour would be in, enlightening for some. Um, uh, uh, so we'll adjourn until 9.30. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.